This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Support Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 220 of the program. Today is Wednesday, November 27th, and we've got a jam-packed episode for you. But before we get to the stories, I want to take some time to thank all of the people who make this show possible. And that is all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased their monthly pledge. And that includes Catherine Marie, Danny Catwell, Dante Trembler, Daphne and Alan Brule, Dominique. Nick Norris, Dravenholt, Earl T. Rosk, Jason Navarro, John Warner, Julia Hoff, Krishna Mali, New Cordeliers Club, Noah Difference, Rachel Rasmussen, Ryan Pickering, Seth Peterson, and Tiffany Lee. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week on the Humanist Report podcast, John Cusack calls for a boycott of MSNBC due to their anti-Bernie bias. Michael Moore gives centrists at MSNBC a reality check. Andrew Yang calls out MSNBC's unfair treatment of his campaign. Chris Matthews gives Bernie Sanders the worst possible advice ever, and he also predictably criticizes him. Bernie Sanders welcomes Mike Bloomberg into the 2020 race by telling him he is not going to be able to successfully buy this election. And Bernie Sanders also capitalizes on Joe Biden's weakness when it comes to the issue of immigration. We'll look at another CNN voter panel, this time featuring Iowa voters who apparently love Amy Klobuchar. Politico pushes an article that might be an insidious attempt to harm Bernie Sanders. And the New York Times compares Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal to Donald Trump's border wall. On top of that, an economist says canceling student loan debt would boost the economy. And we'll talk about the general election taking place in the United Kingdom. And finally, we'll close the show this week by talking to 2020 congressional candidate from New Jersey, Zena Spazakis. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today. Hopefully you guys will enjoy the episode. Uh, it's going to be a shorter week for us because we have Thanksgiving and then Black Friday. So we've just got, you know, a little bit less space to fill. But nonetheless, hopefully you guys will uh, enjoy the show. Let's go ahead and get to that. So actor John Cusack, who I recently learned is part of the Brotherhood of the Bernard, used his gigantic platform to draw attention to a really important issue. And that issue is corporate media's bias against anti-establishment candidates, particularly Bernie Sanders in this instance. Now, he tweeted about this and he also called for a boycott of MSNBC. Here's what he says. Be clear, MSNBC, you did this to yourself. No one made you parade neocons and neoliberal pundits to slander and smear a people's movement that you know is not radical, but a return to FDR politics. I'll just leave this here. Hashtag boycott MSNBC. Now, this is a really strong statement coming from someone who is an actor because everyone always reports on what actors say. So if an actor tweets out something that's political, you know it's going to get attention and could potentially, you know, gain some traction. So he shared a video compilation of MSNBC's bias and I think downright hatred of Bernie Sanders. And we actually talked about this same video compilation a few months back on the program. I think it was July. And this was put together by Winkle the Bernie Bro. And he took clips that Jeff Miami shares on uh, Twitter of just various random instances of, you know, them talking negatively about Bernie Sanders. And really, when you step back and look at all of these clips together, you see that there really is a hatred of Bernie Sanders by corporate pundits. So let's watch the video so that way we get the full context and understand why he thinks a boycott of MSNBC is necessary. Can I bring up the donkey in the room? Bernie? No. 
Bernie Sanders makes my skin crawl. But Sanders fading is a bigger story than people have given her credit for. The previous uh, set of numbers about Kamala Harris seems to suggest that Bernie Rose are actually a real thing. <laughs> He's just waving his arms around, talking about revolution and all. Where we are going, where we won't need roads. I mean, I am. Uh, One of the things I, I always hear from folks. Uh, who aren't necessarily on the burning bus, so to speak, is, is that he's not really a Democrat. I saw Bernie Sanders trying to raise money off of it. Yeah, my, my, my timeline's going to be on fire. But I thought it was horrible. And do you see any crossover, at least in those who are at his events, who kind of look and sound like Trump supporters? When you say he attracts those who feel like they're struggling, they're struggling to be heard and get their bills paid and their voices heard, that sounds like a Trump voter. I, I see him as sort of a, a not pro-woman candidate. And some oh, people say wait, that you've Hillary some, Clinton's candidacy. Well, Bernie Sanders has done nothing between 2016 and today to expand his base, to expand his, his policies. He seemed like a socialist from the 1950s yelling at people um, in the same um, screechy voice, without smiling, without any kind of personal connection. Bernie Sanders has been talking about these same policies essentially since he's been in public service for the past 25, 30 years but he actually hasn't done anything to pass them, right? He's talked a lot about them, but we have not seen any of these policies signed into law. And what and happened for, with Hillary and, and, and what's his name? Exactly. I, you would take the risk. I am you excited. Might Donald Trump Are you again. asking out of every candidate? He's also saying the same thing he said in 2016 this time around. I think that's not working. That's exactly the point I was going to make. I think he kind of got lost in the shuffle. Other people have kind of taken those issues away from him, and he looked like the angry man in the center of the stage saying, get off my lawn. I think he comes off as, as mean. I think he's disparaging. A socialist candidate is more dangerous to this company, country as far as the strength and well-being of our country than Donald Trump. Trump. I would vote for Donald Trump, a despicable <laughs> human being. Mm. No, I, you I, won't. I, I, let me tell you Stop something. yourself. Le so watching that back, it's infuriating, right? I was angry the first time I saw it, but watching it again, it just reminds you that this isn't just a bias that we're talking about. Like, they genuinely hate Bernie Sanders. They simply don't just, you know, uh, prefer other candidates. They hate Bernie Sanders, and they wear it on their sleeves. Like, they're not even good at hiding their disdain for him and his campaign. And it's just disgusting because MSNBC is largely viewed as the liberal or left-wing network, when in actuality, they're not. They are a corporate-friendly network who does the bidding of the establishment because the establishment is who funds them, right? They take in these advertising dollars from the health insurance industry, the defense industry, and in return, you know, they feel as if they don't want to rock the boat too much. And not to mention, a lot of these news pundits, they are multimillionaires, like Chris Matthews. Um, he gets $5 million per year. That's his salary. And does he deserve that? Like, if you look at the segments that he does in the political analysis that he, you know, is engaged in, the man is a buffoon. So these are people who are not just uneducated, but they're also biased. And when you put those two things together, it makes for a really dangerous combination. They are misleading people. Now, this isn't just anecdotal evidence, because we just talked about an In These Times report by Branko Marsetic, who confirms that MSNBC is, in fact, largely ignoring Bernie Sanders. And not only that, when they're not ignoring him, when they actually do choose to talk about him, well, looking at the six main shows on MSNBC, the coverage of Bernie Sanders, again, when he's not being ignored, is disproportionately negative. Now, we know that this isn't just about MSNBC, because a few weeks ago on the program, we talked about the Bernie blackout, where news outlets like CNN and MSNBC, along with the New York Times and Washington Post, they have a tendency to disingenuously report on polls in a way that downplays Bernie Sanders' chances. So if there's a poll where Bernie Sanders is in first or second place, they'll, you know, change the headline to reflect a different dynamic and say, oh, well, Pete Buttigieg just surpassed Elizabeth Warren. Like, that's an example, right? But they don't like Bernie Sanders, and they're trying to not just downplay him, but ignore him. And when they're not ignoring him, they uh, express nothing but hatred for him. So, I mean, I don't blame John Cusack for, you know, wanting to boycott MSNBC, and I'm definitely on board. I've already been boycotting MSNBC, and I only watch when I have to to prepare for the show. But the thing about MSNBC is that those who are already willing to boycott are already doing so. They're seeking out some type of independent news source, be it on YouTube or otherwise, or elsewhere. And, you know, it's just, it's not enough people 
who are just average consumers of news media who just kind of follow politics, not religiously, but they kind of try to pay as much attention as possible. They kind of use MSNBC as their go-to resource because they feel as if they're more reliable because they are ostensibly left-wing. So if you remove that from them, they just kind of feel like they have nothing left, right? They're not as informed and they feel as if that's that's like their go-to, right? So by taking away MSNBC from them, we're kind of removing what to them is probably a crutch. So I don't know that a boycott would even be effective unless people actually know that there are alternative solutions out there. So we need people to not rely so heavily on mainstream media. And if people who were liberal and left-leaning felt as if they had an alternative source, then that would really make a huge difference, right? But because MSNBC is relied upon from people who are left-leaning, they will continue to have a disproportionate amount of influence on Democratic Party primaries and general elections to come. And, you know, that is problematic because they will continue to push corporate-friendly candidates and ignore anti-establishment candidates. And if you're on the left, if you're a Democratic Socialist, you will always support the candidate that is hated by corporate media. So we can never, you know, let our foot off the gas. We've got to constantly apply pressure to MSNBC until they either change or enough people jump ship and really do boycott MSNBC permanently so that way they realize that they don't have to get their news from this corporate news outlet. There are other sources that will inform them and do a better job at it than this corporate sponsored network that doesn't really care about the interests of voters and they're just trying to, you know, uphold the status quo. So at each Democratic Party primary debate, it's easy to see why people are so turned off by corporate media, because it's not even like they're trying to uphold the facade of impartiality or fairness anymore. They just play favorites and shamelessly so. They don't care about the optics. They don't care how bad it looks. They prop up candidates in a very brazen way and um, people notice and we just have to deal with it because this is the way things are going. You know, it's frustrating because Amy Klobuchar was pulling at like 1.5%. She is given the front runner status at these debates. At the last debate, I think she got more talk time than Bernie Sanders. At this debate, she got more talk time than people who are polling higher than her. So mainstream media, they play favorites, right? The establishment centrists, they're their favorites, but the anti-establishment candidates, people like Bernie Sanders, they don't get the treatment that they deserve with respect to their polling status, right? Bernie Sanders is one of the front runners, but he is not given the front runner treatment like Joe Biden or Pete Buttigieg. And another person who is often marginalized at these debates is Andrew Yang. But thankfully, he didn't just call them out, but he demanded an apology from MSNBC because they are being brazenly biased against him. He tweeted, I was asked to appear on MSNBC this weekend and told them that I'd be happy to after they apologize on air, discuss and include our campaign consistent with our polling and allow surrogates from our campaign as they do other candidates. They think we need them. We don't. They've omitted me from their graphics 12 plus times, called me John Yang on air and given me a fraction of the speaking time over two debates despite my polling higher than other candidates on stage. At some point, you have to call it. And that's exactly it. And Andrew Yang is making a really reasonable request here. He's saying, look, I am polling higher than other candidates. So I should be given more coverage than them. Like, I mean, this isn't something that's difficult to grasp, right? Amy Klobuchar should not be given as much coverage as someone like Pete Buttigieg or Joe Biden or Andrew Yang, because again, she's polling at 1.5%, whereas Andrew Yang is in a solid, what, fifth place? But yet he gets disregarded and instead they give glowing coverage to someone like Kamala Harris, who is barely out polling Andrew Yang. They give more coverage to Mike Bloomberg, who is not polling as high as Andrew Yang. And... He's right, you just have to call it. And he's not lying because they have omitted him, like Bernie, from graphics over and over and over again. And overall, they just refuse to cover Andrew Yang's campaign. They rarely mention him. And on top of that, when you look at the distribution of speaking time at that last debate, moderated by MSNBC, you can see why Andrew Yang is angry. He got the least amount of time to speak. Now, when you add in the polling numbers here, it becomes clear that even though he was polling higher than four other people, they still got more time to speak 
than him. And it's even worse when you consider the fact that when he actually was called on, the questions that he got asked were just idiotic. One of the questions that stood out to me was they asked him, what would you say to Vladimir Putin in your first phone call as president? I mean, if you are tuning in and you don't know who Andrew Yang is, how are you supposed to take anything away from that, right? They're not giving him the chance to talk about policy substance and really lay out his agenda because unlike the other candidates, even though I don't necessarily agree with all of the policies that Yang is espousing, he's more substantive than someone like Amy Klobuchar, but yet she gets called on. She gets asked really serious questions about foreign policy and healthcare, but Andrew Yang gets asked, hey, what are you going to say to Vladimir Putin in your first phone call with him? I mean, what are voters supposed to do with this information? Nothing. Nothing. It's pointless. And they're only begrudgingly calling on him at all in candidates like Bernie Sanders because they don't want their apathy and disgust with these types of anti-establishment figures to be super obvious. But I mean, it's already pretty obvious. And Andrew Yang spoke a little bit more about this in an interview with CNN. Well, Anna, Americans tuned in to the debate earlier this week and they saw that I got called on less than any other candidate, including candidates that I'm polling higher than. And the questions I did get had virtually nothing to do with the core ideas of my campaign. And if this were an isolated incident, that would be one thing. But if you go back over the last number of months, MSNBC has literally omitted me from over a dozen fundraising and polling graphics, which it's not about me, it's about the 300,000 plus Americans who've donated to and support my campaign and the millions of Americans who know we need to rewrite the rules of the 21st century economy to work for us. Think about those people donating $10, $20 of their hard-earned money to put a candidate on the stage and then have MSNBC virtually ignore me for 32 minutes or when they tune into MSNBC to see how we're doing in the polls, it's like I don't exist. Everything he's saying here is spot on. This is exactly what they are doing. And as a Bernie Sanders supporter, I can empathize with the anger of his supporters because if you are donating your money to this candidate, you know, and you're you're helping to propel their campaign, you'd expect the media to pay attention. But they're not. And that's really problematic, right? Because we can't live in a true democracy if people don't actually know about the choices that they have. The mainstream media has got to not just focus on their favorites, and they have to actually give fair coverage to all of the candidates. Now, as someone who supports Bernie Sanders over Andrew Yang, I stand in solidarity with Andrew Yang because I know in the future, no matter who I support as a democratic socialist, it's probably going to be the candidate that the mainstream media hates. So whenever we see this bias, we have to call it out because the mainstream media has immense power here. They are able to unilaterally choose winners and losers simply by not talking about a candidate. Like we've gone over this before, but the reason why in part Donald Trump was able to win was because the mainstream media gave him two billion worth of free advertising. Now, yes, that coverage was negative, but just the fact that they talked about him, it primed voters to think about Donald Trump in a way that they thought of other candidates, like he must be legitimate in their minds if the mainstream media is focusing so heavily on him. But candidates who get largely ignored, they don't take them seriously because if the media is not talking about them, if they're not part of the national discussion, then, well, they must not be serious contenders. So we cannot allow the media to choose winners and losers for us. That's not their job. Their job is to inform voters, educate us, make us as informed as we possibly can be before we make our decision in 2020. Now, I truly believe that fairness is the way to go, and we've got to hold them accountable. We can never let them off the hook when they are being blatantly unfair, even if it's for a candidate that isn't your first choice. Because if they're doing this to Andrew Yang, they're going to do this to a future candidate, and they're already doing it to Bernie Sanders, right? So they can't keep doing this. It's completely unfair. The fact that Andrew Yang is out polling people like Amy Klobuchar, but yet they get more time to speak. That is an issue. Now, one caveat, and I made this you know, point in my debate breakdown, is that Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang, at these debates in particular, they are less aggressive in their debate style. Now, when you instigate confrontation, you know, you are going to allow yourself to get more time because that will, you know, facilitate a back and forth between you and someone else. And obviously that will naturally... Um, add to the amount of time you have to talk. But as, you know, moderators of this debate, it's incumbent on them to make sure that everyone is heard equally, or at least with regard to their, you know, position polling-wise. But the fact that someone like uh, Amy Klobuchar is treated like a front-runner, but Andrew Yang, who had zero name recognition nationally, 
is outpulling most establishment figures, for them to ignore that, it's absolutely insane, right? So I absolutely empathize with the anger that Andrew Yang's supporters feel and Andrew Yang himself feels because this is completely unacceptable and good on him for demanding an apology, right? Because this is this can't just keep happening. They can't just keep ignoring candidates in favor of ones that they support. It, it's just, it's so frustrating. But um, this is the uh, media landscape that we are living in. They are all about propping up the status quo. And if you are not one of their favorites, they're not going to treat you fairly. They're not even going to pretend to try to be fair to you anymore. And that's just, you know, that's the state of uh, American politics. The media plays an enormous role in elections and their recklessness and favoritism is having an influence. Like, lefty people tune into MSNBC and view them as a trustworthy source. So people who don't know better are getting duped by MSNBC. And as, you know, people on the left, we have to call this out when we see it. Um, because this is bad for democracy. And that's not hyperbolic to say. This is bad for democracy. We need people to understand all of the choices that they have in front of them. Not just the corporate-friendly choices. But that's not, you know, realistic. So we just have to keep sounding the alarm. So uh, kudos to Andrew Yang and people like John Cusack who are, you know, calling out MSNBC here for being blatantly biased. Chris Matthews is basically the Sean Hannity of MSNBC. And I say this because he's genuinely stupid and he doesn't do real political analysis. He virtue signals, grandstands, and he just sucks up to power. And I say this especially after seeing one of his post-debate hot takes where he gives Democrats and Bernie Sanders the worst advice ever. Because you know how basically being socially liberal is the only real reason to vote for these economically conservative Democrats? Well, what he's saying is that social liberalism, that tenuous advocacy for social justice issues, abandon that and be more socially conservative as well and pander to people who are maybe a little bit more pro-life, a little bit more homophobic maybe. This is literally what he is going to suggest. And on top of that, he's going to tell Bernie Sanders that he shouldn't actually talk about one of the most pressing issues, one of the most um, huge concerns that voters have in this country. Take a look. This is uh, one of the worst analyses, if you could even call it that, that I've seen. Well, I think there's a couple of things that strike me and they're, they're anecdotal. But uh, when Lieutenant Colonel Vindman was telling the story of his life the other day in the hearing, and he talked about America as a country where uh, right matters. And I, and I thought that kind of uh, immigrant patriotism is something that really doesn't have much to do with left versus right. It's sort of a, a feeling about the country. You may want to make radical change in this country, like Woody Guthrie, this land is our land, or, or Kate Smith and God bless America. But there has to be sort of a, a, a piece there about America and your, and your affection for the country you start with and then you work from that to fix it. And I think when I look at some of the issues about choice or issues, issues like same-sex marriage and all, I think the Democrats always miss the, the cultural piece. They, they see me right on the economics, but they miss the cultural piece the, the, and how you, people feel about things. I mean, I can be, I've been pro-choice since Roe v. Wade was, in, was a court decision, but I have a different view about abortion than other people do. I think Pelosi does too. I think Pennsylvania is pro-life in a, in a way that's pretty real. And I think it was one of the reasons why Trump went up there. Now, Trump is a Montebank. He's a charlatan. But he plays on these cultural issues, make America great again. They're honest feelings, but he exploits them and, and distorts them in his purposes. I think affection and patriotic feeling about the country and feeling about life and choice and traditional values, if you will, the Democrats are very cold about those things, and I think they really miss a chance to win by simply identifying with the feelings of the country better than they do. And that's the only thought I have tonight. And I caught it again tonight with Bernie Sanders saying, the country's corrupt, our system's corrupt. Be careful about that language, Bernie. You know, be careful that our system of politics is corrupt. That's too strong. I'm sorry, it has corrupt aspects. But to say our democracy is corrupt is a bad starting point with a lot of people's hearts about this country. That's what I think. That isn't what voters want, Chris. That's what you want. 
Because if Democrats actually listened to you and took your advice, they would be far worse off than they are now. And it's just, it's, it's mind boggling to me that this fool gets paid a $5 million per year salary and he does zero research. He doesn't know what he's talking about seemingly. And his show is called Hardball when all he does is throw softball questions to people in power. I mean, this is why people don't take corporate media seriously. But let's get to some of the specifics here. He thinks that Democrats should be more patriotic, whatever that means. Um, and he says, I think when I look to some of the issues like choice and same-sex marriage and all, I think Democrats always miss the cultural piece. They're right on economics, but they miss the cultural piece and how they feel about things. Now, that was word salad. But what he's saying here is completely idiotic. It's always usually Democrats who win the culture wars and it's Republicans who are lagging behind, but he wants them to not miss the mark on things like abortion and same-sex marriage. First of all, it's 2019. Marriage equality was legalized in 2015. Are you advocating that they rehash this issue in order to pander to evangelicals? Like, I, like, I don't know what this looks like in practice, but if I had to guess, this strategy would be a massive failure. And on top of that, he says Democrats are very cold about traditional values and whatnot, and quote, I think they really miss a chance to win by simply identifying with the feelings of the country. In other words, abandon your base even more and shift further to the right. Can you imagine? The one draw, the one reason people come out to vote for Democrats is largely due to harm reduction because socially speaking, they're not going to take away civil rights like Republicans will. But what he's saying basically is uh, you're missing the mark and uh, you are already economically conservative. That's great. But do better when it comes to traditional values. Chris, just register as a Republican. I mean, I don't know what the end goal is for him. If they shift further to the right, they abandon even a larger portion of their base. You do know that they were wiped out under Obama because they were too conservative, right? And people don't come out to vote because they don't perceive there to be a real difference between Democrats and Republicans. So if you actually see this in practice, Democrats would be non-existent. We just have one big party and it's already one big party in DC that just looks out for special interests and elites and oligarchs. But if you take away that advocacy for, you know, social justice issues, there's zero difference between Democrats and Republicans. It's just one big Republican party in DC. I mean, this is this is obviously the worst advice ever. Ever. <laughs> He also randomly brings up Bernie Sanders and says that uh, Bernie Sanders shouldn't say that the country and system is corrupt. Be careful with that language, Bernie. Be careful. That's too strong. It has corrupt aspects. But to say that our democracy is corrupt is a bad starting point with a lot of people's hearts about this country. Again, it is absolutely absurd that he gets paid $5 million per year to say things that he knows nothing about. He is incredibly uninformed because that is not where the american people are at a gallup poll found that 75 percent of americans believed corruption was widespread this is from 2015 but nonetheless the findings show that he's wrong and the american people align with bernie on this issue and on top of that even if it was politically incorrect to point that out, to call out the corruption, a 2014 Princeton University study found that we basically live in an oligarchy, effectively, right? When you look at policy outcomes, normal citizens have a statistically insignificant impact on policy outcomes, whereas elites and special interests, they dictate all policy outcomes. That's due to corruption. Campaign contributions, legalized bribes, that's the result of corruption. So to say, uh, don't talk about corruption because you're offending people who are patriotic. You have no clue what you're talking about. And criticizing America is the highest form of patriotism. So shut the fuck up, you shill. See, this really is what manufacturing consent looks like. He is trying to get you to not question 
the corruption that is rampant in D.C. Don't question the Democratic Party being complicit in this corruption. Just don't even question anything. Just accept the system and love the country and shut the fuck up, peasant, because I'm making $5 million per year and I don't want you dipshits to ruin that for me. Just, just <laughs> pull the mask off and say it. Just say that you love the status quo and you love capitalism because the system is serving you really well. The establishment is serving you very well. Just admit it, dipshit. Now, on top of that, um, another clip that I want to play from his post-debate uh, analysis, analysis, I use that word loosely, is uh, he decided to shit on Bernie Sanders more and talked about a strategy that would basically guarantee another loss in 2020 if they took his advice. And he's doing all of this, mind you, while talking to Amy Klobuchar, who's pulling at 1.5%. And he's going to proceed to, you know, give her credit for having the correct strategy, not Bernie, <laughs> someone who's actually a front runner, but it's the 1.5 percenter who has the correct strategy. Listen, I, I noticed something tonight that is growing within each debate, with yes. each debate. It is a real San Andreas fault, the Democratic Party today. You can talk about you all don't like Trump, you don't want to get rid of it, but Bernie won't even agree with that. His first chance tonight, and he basically said, this isn't about getting rid of Trump. This is about my big social democratic revolution I want to start. Going through the same old litany of numbers. He doesn't accept your argument that you have to appeal to moderates. You got to get some moderate center to left Democrats, some centrists, and some Republicans. And then you and Buttigieg and the vice president, for Marshall, all argued you have to go for a larger audience than just the, the hard left. Exactly. He doesn't accept that. And Elizabeth Warren, Dan Rowe, doesn't accept it either. That's the fight, isn't it? We just tried this strategy in 2016. Donald Trump is the president. That's how effective your strategy is. Appealing to moderates and Republicans is not going to be conducive to victory. And for every moderate you win over by being Republican light, you're going to end up losing 10 more left wingers. Because as you shift to the right, you abandon your base. And then those people just stay home. So the strategy is to go after non-voters and people who haven't been participating in the process, people who are voting for the Green Party. Go after them. Go after the left because you can't win without your base. And I shouldn't have to explain this in 2019 after we just tried the strategy with Hillary Clinton. Like, I shouldn't have to explain this. It should be common knowledge. They should have learned their lesson. But guess what? They're never going to learn their lesson. And even if... Let's say, hypothetically speaking, worst case scenario, Joe Biden is the nominee and he runs to the center in the general election and loses. In 2024, we'll be having the same conversation. And people like Chris Matthews will be saying, well, the party's shifting too far to the left. We need to hold the center. It doesn't matter how many times this strategy loses. Chris Matthews is comfortable, so he doesn't actually have to care about winning. He just wants the candidates to talk about policy in a way that makes him feel comfortable that you know speaks to his patriotic core okay well if they take your advice chris they're going to be worse off than they already are so what he should do if he truly cared about democrats winning is resign and stop spewing propaganda because if they actually take your advice trump gets a second term so if you truly care about defeating trump which he says he does then uh quit stop doing propaganda because you clearly don't know what you're talking about and you are offering democrats the worst possible advice just quit so we've been talking a lot lately about msnbc's bias and quite frankly their hatred towards bernie sanders um and how they're not speaking truth to power and how by and large they are misinforming viewers and they're not allowing people who tune into msnbc to know about the range of options that they have in 2020 and if you watch msnbc i can't imagine that you know much about policies, let alone about everyone who's running. But every once in a while, they'll bring on a guest who will actually penetrate that bubble and speak truth to power. This time, Michael Moore was brought on, and he was on a panel with Brian Williams, Claire McCaskill, Joanne Reed, and Steve Schmidt, and he gave them the reality check that they desperately needed, and everything he said was spot on. Take a look. I think that we have to, when you guys were talking about how we have to be more moderate or move to the center, that's how we're going to win. Uh, next year. See, to me, I think moving to the center, I am the center. I, I am the mainstream now of the Democratic Party. The majority of Americans agree with me and Bernie on all the issues. 
whether it's whether it's uh, health care for all, whether it's climate change, um, minimum wage, mass incarceration, but down the whole list, the, the, the American people have moved left. So the center is, is now more of these sorts of things. This is what we believe. So when you say that, like, for instance, with um, uh, Joe Biden said tonight, 160 million Americans want to keep their, their private insurance, says who? Are you actually talking to people about this? They, yes, they want the assurance that whatever we have with the new Medicare for all is essentially just a transfer from what they have with their good union health care. It's going to be that, but it's going to be better for you. You're not going to have co-pays and deductibles. Fine. But what the average Democrat and the average American does not like the health insurance company. They hate Aetna and Cigna and United Healthcare. These are people that they're fighting with to get them to pay a bill that they won't pay. The, the healthcare industry has caused more pain and harm and anxiety for the American people than practically any other industry. And, and we should never side with candidates that are gonna say, we're gonna, we're gonna keep this private profit-making thing going. That's not where the American people are at. They are fed up with this. And I'll tell you, I got an earful of it back home in Flint last month when General Motors was on strike. Yep. What did the CEO of GM do on the third day of the strike? She took away their health care. She shut it down. They couldn't believe it. Nobody, my, I come from a GM family. We, we I mean, GM, your health care, UAW employee, sure. it's everything, medical, dental, eye care. You even get a free lawyer if you need one. I mean, it's like, it's the best. And on the third day, they saw the thing that they thought they'd have forever could be taken away by the company like that. And that's what people need to know, that we can never allow our health insurance to be in the hands of a private profit-making company where they can end you tomorrow. Anybody watching the show right now, your boss could wake up in the morning and go, you know what, Steve, the, it just cost us too much money you know, here to have this, to have this uh, health insurance for the employees. We gotta cut it back, we gotta raise the deductible. They can do this just like that. That should be illegal. It's a human right, and we need to be like every other industrialized country that has this. So that was virtually perfect. There's really nothing that I can say to supplement that clip because it, it was perfect. He said everything that I would have said if I were on that panel, except he probably said it more eloquently. That was beautiful. I am the center. Americans have moved left. I mean, we shouldn't have to explain that to MSNBC hosts, but here we are. They believe that if you support something like Medicare for All, you are an extremist, when in actuality, this is a return to FDR-style politics. This is not a new policy. Democrats have had single payer as a goal for decades now. But yet, all of a sudden, this is something that's radical. If you support this, you're radical. Actually, no, that's not the case. Democratic Party voters support Medicare for All. And before centrist Democrats started attacking it, polls started to show that even a majority, not a plurality, a majority of Republicans backed single payer, Medicare for All. So when you say and suggest that, you know, supporting progressive policies like free college and Medicare for All and a Green New Deal are extremist and far left, that's a lie. Because people who are progressive are the center. Now, it's a little bit misleading because if you ask people, more often than not, they will self-identify as conservative. But when you go issue by issue, people are, by and large, more left-leaning, more progressive. So political labels themselves are not that useful. You have to go by the policies. And when you look at the policies, when you look at the platforms of 2020 candidates, they're with Bernie Sanders more so than any other candidate, perhaps. Now, on top of that, the point that he made about health insurance was just amazing. He said, Joe Biden said tonight, 160 million Americans want to keep their private insurance. Says who? Are you actually talking to people about this? He goes on to say, the average American does not like their healthcare company. They hate Aetna and Cigna and United Healthcare. These are the people, they're fighting to get them to pay a bill that they won't pay. The healthcare industry caused more pain, harm, and anxiety for people than practically any other industry, and we should never side with candidates that say we're just going to keep the private profit-making thing going. That's not where the American people are at. And then he went on to talk about how General Motors used the healthcare that they they provide to employees as leverage while they were striking. I mean, 
hearing someone say something like this about health insurance companies on mainstream media, it's like seeing a rainbow because it's so rare. But whenever you see it, you can't not stop and look and just appreciate it because it's so beautiful. I mean, everything he says here is 100% correct. People do not like their private insurance companies. And whenever there's this talk of people wanting to keep their private insurance, no, they want to keep their doctors. They want to make sure that if we transition to Medicare for all, they'll have the same level of coverage. For most people, their insurance is going to be better under Medicare for all, and they're going to be paying less. We're not getting what other countries are getting, and we need to move to where the rest of the world is. And the last thing I want to end on here is a quote from Michael Moore, which is just, it's perfect. It's the perfect quote to end on. We can never allow our health insurance to be in the hands of a private profit-making company where they can end you tomorrow. Anybody watching the show, your boss can wake up in the morning and take away your health insurance on a whim like that. Why are we allowing this system to persist? Why? This is a system that is riddled with instability. There are 500,000 plus medical bill related bankruptcies that take place every single year tens of thousands die because they don't have health insurance why are we letting corporate media who are using talking points from the industry and politicians who are funded by the industry dupe us into accepting a system that is against our best interests we shouldn't so mainstream media isn't going to educate people on this but every once in a while there will be a guest like Michael Moore who comes on and says exactly what people who tune into MSNBC need to hear and frame it in a way that's so brilliant that I hope that it gets them to think more deeper about these issues that the mainstream media downplays and dismisses and does propaganda you know, against. Medicare for All is something that we need desperately. And anyone in the mainstream media, any politician who's arguing against it, is literally trying to convince you to be in favor of something, in favor of a system that is trying to kill you and bankrupt you. They don't care about you, they care about profits. Medicare for All would shift the goal from increasing profit to delivering healthcare. That's what we need, that's what would save lives and stop medical bankruptcies once and for all. Kudos to Michael Moore for actually saying this on national television. I wish that more people would say that, but you know, I'm sure that... It, uh, if you did say this regularly, you wouldn't be invited back on. And uh, we'll see if Michael Moore gets invited back on. MSNBC surprisingly brings him on fairly frequently. But if he keeps this up, I doubt he's going to get many uh, invites in the future. But we'll see. As much as I loathe corporate media, they are clever. Because they can get people to think about things without actually saying it explicitly. So one example is the way that they've been priming viewers to view Bernie Sanders as the Trump of the left, so to speak. Now, they never say this directly, but they want you to think about Bernie Sanders as a type of left-wing Trump who will bring about, you know, the same level of irrationality and political instability that we are dealing with right now. And the last example that we saw came from MSNBC when they asked Bernie Sanders at a debate whether or not it's appropriate for his uh, crowds to be chanting, lock him up with regard to Donald Trump. Now, it's a question that has zero substance, but they asked it because they want you to think that Bernie Sanders is just like Donald Trump. It's a false equivalence, but nonetheless, this is how they kind of delegitimize Bernie Sanders because they know that lefties dislike Donald Trump, so if you kind of paint Bernie as a Trumpian figure, well, that delegitimizes him in the eyes of some left-wing viewers, and it's a strategy that I think actually is uh, relatively successful. Now, the overall anti-establishment appeal, appeal that Bernie Sanders has, I think, is going to help him. But we still have to look at what they're doing because this is incredibly brazen. Um, and they used to be a little bit more subtle, but increasingly, as the primary goes on as they, and they get more desperate to defeat Bernie Sanders, they are becoming a lot more brazen. So the last example that I saw besides the debate came from Lisa Friedman of the New York Times, who claimed that Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal is like Donald Trump's border wall. It's as unrealistic and irrational as Trump's border wall. Obviously, false equivalence because one plan wants to save the planet, another is uh, xenophobic and wants to keep immigrants out. Nonetheless, uh, she wants you to think 
that Bernie and Trump, they're just like each other, one's on the right, one's on the left. And the argument is incredibly sloppy and lazy. Nonetheless, the New York Times published it, and we're going to dissect it. She argues, Senator Bernie Sanders' 16 trillion vision for arresting global warming would put the government in charge of the power sector and promise that by 2030, the country's electricity and transportation systems would run entirely on wind, solar, hydropower, or geothermal energy, with the fossil fuel industry footing much of the bill, much as Mexico was to pay for the border wall. Climate scientists and energy economists say the plan is technically impractical, politically unfeasible, and possibly ineffective. Yet, the criticism does not appear to bother many of the young voters who will have an important role in selecting a Democratic presidential candidate and who overwhelmingly place climate change at the top of their priority lists, according to polls. David Victor, a professor of international relations at the University of California, San Diego, and a climate advisor to Pete Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, called that the big challenge for serious policy in the Democratic Party. Quote, the progressive wing wants radical change and climate change is one of those areas where this has really been the most palpable, he said. The Sanders plan claims to deliver radical change, but it can't work in the real world. Now, just in those couple of paragraphs, there's so many problems with this. Comparing Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal to Donald Trump's border wall, it's idiotic. Because there's no way that we can compel Mexico to pay for a policy that we want, right? We don't have jurisdiction over Mexico. Bernie Sanders, however, can compel fossil fuel companies to pay for climate change, adaptation, and mitigation policy because we can tax them. We can't tax Mexico, but we can tax fossil fuel companies and implement reforms that would change the way that our economy functions, move us away from a fossil fuel-focused economy onto a green economy. In fact, there are countries that are already doing this. China is doing this. So for her to compare that to Mexico, uh, Trump's uh, call for Mexico paying for our border wall, that's not just disingenuous. That's dumb. That's a dumb thing to say. And we get it. You want to compare Bernie to Donald Trump because you think that that's going to turn off voters. But in doing that, you're just making yourself look stupid because this isn't going to appeal to anyone. Like, who's going to think that these two policies are even in the same league? One wants to save the planet. One is xenophobic. Like, this is this is just dumb. And she also says that Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal is politically impractical and unfeasible. Whenever there's this really enormous political challenge, there's going to be naysayers who are either too lazy or too afraid to take action. But the thing about that is usually, like, if you're going to say what other people said you would provide like a hyperlink so we can look at what they said specifically about Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal. But she did not link to anything. She just pulled that out of her asshole in hopes that you wouldn't do your research. Now, of course, later on in the article, she goes on to unsurprisingly quote Democratic Party strategists and people who are just going to shit on Bernie Sanders, but she doesn't make a real persuasive argument here, and she ends up undercutting the legitimacy of her argument, not that there was much there to begin with, by quoting David Victor, who was Pete Buttigieg's climate change advisor. Now, the reason why she quoted him specifically is because she wants to, one, prop up Pete Buttigieg indirectly by making it seem like he's surrounding himself with people who are more practical, more realistic, but in actuality, who is David Victor? Well, this article from Hill, he tells you everything you need to know about David Victor. Quote, Pete Buttigieg, climate advisor, is a fossil fuel funded witness for the Trump administration against children's climate lawsuit. So congratulations. To prop up your argument against Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal, you cited a literal fossil fuel shill. The New York Times published this. Are you proud of this work? <laughs> like, I mean, this isn't the best messenger to argue against the Green New Deal. If you're going to bring on climate scientists to argue about Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal and how there's areas for improvement, because I'm sure that there are, then do that. But you're quoting a fossil fuel shill who's working with Pete Buttigieg, who isn't serious about climate change mitigation. What scientists are telling us is not only that we now have 11 years to act, but we need World War II level political mobilization to actually stop a climate catastrophe. Bernie is here 
trying to meet the demands of scientists and you're choosing to shit on him and say that his Green New Deal is just like Donald Trump's border wall plea. It's that unfeasible and politically impractical. Shame on you. Shame on you. And throughout the article, she cites people who smugly dismiss Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal. It's just, it's downright shameful. This is why people don't trust the media. Because you're not even trying to be honest. You're quoting a fossil fuel shill who, of course, is going to shit on Bernie Sanders' plan. Who's in bed with Pete Buttigieg, who, of course, is going to shit on Bernie Sanders' plan. If you want to have some type of good faith criticism, then that's fine. We're not against criticism. Bernie Sanders is not above criticism. Objectivity is important. And if there's genuine ways that he can craft his Green New Deal that would improve it and make it more effective, I'd be all for it. But you're citing a fossil fuel shill. And you're comparing him to Donald Trump. I mean, there's nothing left to say about this. Shame on this author. Shame on the New York Times for publishing garbage like this. This is what we have to deal with. Disingenuous people who are bad faith actors who aren't actually trying to make a good faith case against the Green New Deal. She's arguing against it by using what shills have to say about the Green New Deal. Yeah, sorry, but these people are the last people who I want to hear from. Disgusting. So I know that I'm preaching to the choir by saying this, but it can't be overstated. Bernie Sanders single-handedly has revolutionized campaign fundraising in America by relying exclusively on small dollar donors and not millionaires or billionaires. He demonstrated to everyone that you don't have to sell out to get elected. That is no longer a necessary evil. You could subvert the whole process and just raise money by going to the people. In fact, this campaign just announced that they surpassed 4 million individual donations, which is more than any candidate in US history. Now, this scares the establishment because it gives Bernie Sanders an advantage that basically no other candidate with the exception of Elizabeth Warren has, longevity. Because small dollar donors are propping up this campaign, he can stay in until the very end right? The campaign funds are not going to dry up anytime soon. He has monthly recurring donations from people who are nowhere near maxing out, who are going to allow him to stay in all the way until the convention. And the establishment hates that. So corporate media, they're trying to find ways to not only downplay what he's managed to accomplish, like we've talked about the segments on CNN before, but they're trying to find ways to maybe dissuade people possibly from donating to Bernie Sanders. And Politico published an article with a message that's subtle but possibly nefarious where they want you to maybe rethink the donations that you're giving to Bernie because by donating to him, you may be inadvertently propping up the entities and organizations who you claim to hate. So they published an article titled, How Bernie's Small Donors Are Making Credit Card Companies Rich. Now, based on that title, when I saw this, I thought, oh, this must be about how poor people are so inspired by Bernie Sanders that they are using credit cards to donate because they don't have any cash on hand. They don't have money. So they're kind of putting it on the credit card and, you know, putting themselves into debt to help Bernie because they believe in him that much. That's something that I did. Like in 2016, I donated to Bernie Sanders using my credit card because that was all that I had and I wanted to help him out. So that's what I thought this was about. But that's not what this is about at all. So the article's headline is a little bit misleading. What this is actually about is the fact that there are processing fees that apply to every single transaction. Now to that I say, yeah, obviously, whenever you swipe your credit card or debit card, there is a processing fee. And, you know, the more times you donate to Bernie Sanders, the more times there will be a processing fee that will go to these credit card companies. Now, I really don't think this is anything that is uh, too surprising to people. Nonetheless, Politico linked to a newsy video where they kind of gave you this objective breakdown that's presented in a very matter-of-fact way that doesn't really dive too deep into, you know, the implications and what this means for you as a Bernie Sanders donor. Take a look. Donating to your favorite political candidate online is easy. It can take just one click, or if you set up recurring donations, you don't have to do anything at all. The internet has revolutionized how donors behave. 
People now give more frequently and in smaller amounts than ever before. But if you want to be part of getting me on the debate stage, just go to yang2020.com uh, and donate a buck. But every time you donate online, there's a processing cost. And while it might be pennies on the dollar, those pennies add up. And in recent years, as small dollar donations have ramped up, credit card processing costs have exploded. Jonathan Zucker is the former CEO of Democratic payment processor Act Blue. He's watched this whole transformation unfold. He is about eight years old. What it really boils down to is it's just easier to make a small dollar donation than it used to be. The reality is no one would make out $105 checks and give them to 100 candidates. But you can absolutely do that with online giving. On the one hand, large numbers of small dollar donors investing in the political process is very good for democracy. On the other hand, they are also good for uh, the, the credit card processors. Between 2008 and 2016, the amount that federal campaigns reported spending on credit card processing fees roughly doubled, going from $28 million to $52 million. 2020 campaigns have already racked up millions in fees, and they're on track to surpass any previous election cycle. Since 2008, more than $200 million has gone towards credit card processing fees. Of course, political fundraising overall has been on the rise, but more and more of every dollar donated has been going to credit card processing fees instead of to the candidate. And this cycle, the Sanders campaign has reported the highest processing bills. The reality of card processing is that the smaller the transaction amount, the larger the percentage of that transaction that disappears into fixed fees. So the first thing I'll say is no, it's not the internet that revolutionized how donors behave. It's Bernie Sanders exclusively who revolutionized the way donors behaved. Obama ran for president during the internet era and he didn't raise small dollar donations. He was taking money from Wall Street. So don't give the internet credit for something that Bernie Sanders did. Bernie Sanders changed the game. So give him the credit that he deserves. But with that being said, the video itself, I don't really have any problems with that because if they're just going to educate people and explain how, yes, every single time you use your card, there's a processing fee, and the more times you use it, the more fees that will be going to these credit card companies, like, I have no problem with that. However, the problem is that this video that Politico links to only got 222 views, and on top of that, it's unlisted, which means that more people probably read the article than just watched the video. Now, the problem is the article itself takes a few extra steps to kind of make Bernie Sanders supporters think about whether or not they should continue their contributions. They write, what these grassroots supporters may not realize is that in making small, repeated contributions, they have, in aggregate, delivered a huge payday for the middlemen, often large banks and financial institutions that process those payments. It's important that people realize that the more transactions they engage in, the more credit card companies are making money, said Jonathan Zucker, the co-founder of Democracy Engine and former CEO of Act Blue, the nonprofit payment processing behemoth catering to Democratic campaigns. While it may only be a matter of sense, those pennies pile up. Nearly one tenth of that money came from Sanders' presidential campaign, which has paid credit card processors more than 2.3 million, the most of any candidate this cycle. Second is Warren, whose 1.75 million in processing payments narrowly edged out Pete Buttigieg's 1.73 million. Donors, however, appear to be making a less informed choice. An October Newsy Ipsos poll found that nearly half of donors didn't know processing fees were taken out of their donations. At least 44% said knowing the connection between donation size and fees could change how they donate. If your goal is to reduce the amount of money that you're paying credit card companies with your donations, then you want to limit the number of donations you make, Zucker said. The more donors combine smaller donations into larger, less frequent contributions, he said, the more those campaigns are going to have 
have at the end of the day. Susan Weisner, a Sanders supporter who has already donated small amounts to his campaign dozens of times this cycle, said she had no idea that slices of her donations were never going to credit card fees. Never knew they took that deduction, Weisner said. Now that she knows making many small donations instead of a large one increases the cut going to processing fees, she said she may change the way she donates. She said she plans to tell her friends to do the same. I'll pass it along. So the implication here is maybe if you are a small donor who has donated repeatedly to Bernie Sanders, maybe rethink your uh, donating habits. Maybe instead of just sending in $5, Put that $5 aside, wait until you have, you know, $25 to spare and donate that amount to him. So that way you're giving less money to the credit card companies and the processing fee itself is smaller and then Bernie gets more money. Now that in and of itself, it's not the most problematic takeaway, but this is potentially damaging to Bernie Sanders. And the article, frankly, is relatively reckless because think about this. What are people going to do in actuality? If they're rethinking their small donations, well, they'll put it off. And if they put it off, there's a chance knowing that people are busy and, you know, we have short attention spans as human beings, we might not get back to it. We might, we might not donate rather than, you know, saving our money to donate a bigger donation to Bernie Sanders. We might just put it off and not do it. So this could be a problem. Now, I'm not going to argue that this is some nefarious plot by Politico to take down Bernie Sanders. All I'm saying is they need to be very careful and not try to discourage small donations. Because let me tell you all something that every person who is progressive should know. There is absolutely no ethical consumption under capitalism. However you spend your dollars, even if you think it's going to a good cause, in some way directly or indirectly, your money is propping up some type of organization, institution, or entity that is fighting to oppress you, right? So you can't really worry too much about this. What you need to worry about is the goal. And the goal is getting Bernie Sanders elected. And at the end of the day, if you can only spare $5, should you put that off so you can avoid this processing fee? No. Donate to Bernie Sanders. In fact, do it right now, no matter how big a donation you want to make. Because remember that that fee that a credit card company is taking, that's going to be something that they're going to be paying back when Bernie Sanders wins and raises their taxes. So you can't stress the little things like this. Like this is a necessary evil. Act Blue is something that all candidates use running for Congress or otherwise because it's the easiest way to raise money like what are you what are you supposed to do there's no way that you can run a campaign and not prop them up it's either you do small dollar donations or you take money from special interests what matters is the policies that bernie sanders and these grassroots candidates are pushing right so yes we can acknowledge that maybe in the event we kind of consolidated our donations and rather than sending in five separate five dollar donations it would be better if we sent in one 25 dollar donation that's not practical for everyone like if you have five dollars and bernie sanders is asking you for a donation send him five dollars don't worry about the processing fee because again we're going to tax these bastards anyway uh so the regulation is what matters and second of all don't be afraid that your money is helping these organizations because this alternative is much better than a credit card company donating directly to candidates and effectively buying them off. So if Bernie Sanders is having a portion of my donation go to a credit card processing fee or whatever, I like who cares? It is pennies and yes, it does add up, but they're trying to basically dissuade you from donating in, you know, these small sums, but it, it's that's just practical. It's it's what more people feel comfortable doing. Like, we have $5 here, $10 there. So it's not realistic to expect people to donate like a $50 donation or a $25 donation. So Politico needs to be more responsible and less reckless here and make sure that they make it crystal clear that they're not trying to dissuade people from donating to candidates that they support, right? Do not give less money. But they've got to know that if, if you kind of turn people off to the process itself that a lot of people will see that and think, oh, well, I don't want my money going to these credit card companies. Fuck them. I'm not going to donate anymore. Sorry, Bernie. But let me stress this. He needs money. Without money, he will not win. So regardless, if you can spare $1 or $5, do it. Don't wait. Donate when you can. 
and as much as you can. If you can donate $25 again instead of five individual $5 payments, do it. But do not be dissuaded by this article. Don't think that you're doing something wrong by donating to Bernie Sanders because credit card companies are going to take a processing fee. Wherever you go, whenever you swipe your debit card, you're, you're going to be paying that processing fee regardless. So again, I don't want to seem like I'm conspiratorial and suggest that Politico is trying to, you know, hurt Bernie Sanders in a direct way. Maybe this is harmless, but my overall argument here and what I want you to take away from this is that we can't be dissuaded from donating to Bernie Sanders because if we truly want change, we have to support him by donating. So donate if you can, no matter what the amount is. Put that aside. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Wherever you buy food, no matter what you do, you are propping up these institutions and entities that hurt you, that oppress you. So you can't just be selective, especially in this area where we really, really need these grassroots donations to help Bernie Sanders. Like without this, his campaign dies. So as far as I see, you know, the way I see right now, it's a necessary evil. Fuck whatever, you know, argument they're making. If you got five bucks, donate that five bucks. Who cares about the processing fee right now? We're going to tax them later. This is a long-term investment that, we're, that we are making in Bernie Sanders' campaign. So please, whatever you do, don't let this article turn you off. Grassroots donations, small dollar donations, that matters too, right? So if you can only spare three bucks or a dollar to a candidate or Bernie Sanders, donate that. Don't wait because, you know, we have busy lives and more often than not, rather than just waiting, we're going to end up forgetting to donate that money or spend it. So donate. Don't worry. Just do what you can to help Bernie Sanders. He needs money. We need money to win. And, you know, you can't not donate because of this. That's what I want to stress. Uh, donate now. Well, we all knew that this was coming, but now it's official. The former mayor of New York City who banned big gulps and implemented the notoriously racist stop and frisk policy, Mike Bloomberg, is jumping in the 2020 race. And yes, it is almost December. And in case you weren't keeping track, this is the second billionaire to jump into the 2020 Democratic Party primary. So we have three billionaires running for president if you count Donald Trump. Now, Mike Bloomberg, to say he's rich would be an understatement because he is really rich. We're talking ninth richest person in the United States, 14th richest person in the world. And he is worth an estimated $54 billion. And he's also a piece of shit. Evidence being, uh, here's him hanging out with Harvey Weinstein. And speaking of sexual predators, here he is hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein's friend, Ghislaine Maxwell, who allegedly found girls for Epstein to rape. And here he is hanging out with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who, let me remind you, is a murderous dictator who is literally culpable for the brutal murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And here he is with fellow billionaire Donald Trump, who he claims is horrible, but I guess, you know, not horrible enough to be buddy-buddy with, apparently. And unsurprisingly, you know, he's a he's a greedy billionaire who is a terrible person. But what makes this worse is that he has managed to buy his way into the race by spending millions upon millions of dollars. In fact, he's spending $30 million in television advertisements in 29 states in just one week, which is more than all of his 2020 rivals have spent all year. And unsurprisingly, you know, flooding the markets with your message actually helps because he's already polling at 2.3%. And this is an incredibly crowded field. So he just announced, and he's already in seventh place ahead of Tulsi Gabbard, Amy Klobuchar, Cory Booker, and Tom Steyer. And in the video where he announces his decision to run for president, you know, you can already tell that the reception is great because he disabled likes and dislikes along with comments. So <laughs> that's definitely an indication that the people are really feeling it. Now, in the event you haven't already saw this ad, because there's a chance that 
uh, that ad played before this video, literally. Well, here's the ad that he is running on. Um, you're gonna see that there's zero policy substance to be found here. Mike Bloomberg started as a middle-class kid who had to work his way through college, then built a business from a single room to a global entity, creating tens of thousands of good-paying jobs along the way. He could have stopped there. But when New York suffered the terrible tragedy of 9-11, he took charge, becoming a three-term mayor who brought a city back from the ashes and brought back jobs and hope with it, creating tens of thousands of affordable housing units so families could have a decent place to live, raising teachers' salaries and kids' graduation rates, and creating a more open and livable city for the millions who call it home. He could have stopped there. But when he witnessed the terrible toll of gun violence, he put his money where his heart is, helping to create a movement to take on the NRA and the politicians they own to protect families across this country and help turn the tide. And he's funded college educations for thousands of deserving low-income and middle-class kids and supported life-saving medical research and stood up to the coal lobby and the outright denial of this administration to protect the only home we have from the growing menace of climate change. But now he sees a different kind of menace coming from Washington. So there's no stopping here. Because there's an America waiting to be rebuilt, where everyone without health insurance is guaranteed to get it, and everyone who likes theirs can go ahead and keep it. Where the wealthy will pay more in taxes, and the struggling middle class will get their fair share. And jobs that just allow you to get by will become jobs that let you get ahead. Mike Bloomberg for president, jobs creator, leader, problem solver. It's going to take all three to build back a country. So in a nutshell, orange men bad, I'm rich and I use my money to do some good things and also Medicare for all is bad. And what he says about Medicare for all is insanely vague. He says, where everyone, uh, he believes in a system where everyone without health insurance is guaranteed to get it and everyone who likes theirs can go ahead and keep it. Now, I assumed just by watching that that he's basically endorsing a public option, but when you go to his website, it's even more vague than that. He really doesn't say anything. He states that his goal is to expand Obamacare and Medicare as a way of achieving universal coverage, which... What does that even mean? That's not a policy prescription. That's a vague non-commitment to make our current system, I guess, slightly less shitty. I don't even know what to take away from that. But the only reason why any of us are talking about Mike Bloomberg, the reason why people are taking him seriously, is because he is a billionaire. And more specifically, he is the billionaire deemed the savior of the Democratic Party since Joe Biden is most likely going to lose. Because, I mean... He's face planted. He has a gaffe every 30 seconds. It's evident that voters aren't really feeling Joe Biden and the electability argument isn't holding much water now. So in comes people like Deval Patrick and billionaire Mike Bloomberg to save the day. But the one candidate, the only candidate rather, who's truly taking on the billionaire class had something to say about Mike Bloomberg and uh, why he shouldn't expect to win. We do not believe that billionaires have the right to buy elections. And that is why we are going to overturn Citizens United. That is why multi-billionaires like Mr. Bloomberg are not going to get very far in this election. That is why we're going to end voter suppression in America. Because we believe, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart. Look, I've been, you know, run for office many, many times for a month. Most of the times I've won, but I've lost. But it never, ever occurred to me as a candidate or as a senator to figure out how I could suppress the vote of my opponents. If I can't win an election based on my ideas, I shouldn't win that election. Now, on top of that, as Owen Higgins of Common Dreams reports, Sanders in a statement Friday in advance of Bloomberg's entrance into the race said he was disgusted that Bloomberg believed the race could be bought. I'm disgusted by the idea that Michael Bloomberg or any other billionaire thinks they can circumvent the political process and spend tens of millions of dollars to buy our elections, Sanders said. 
And that's exactly it. Um, the fact that this is possible, it really speaks to how we don't really live in a democracy. This is an oligarchy, right? If you have to be rich to win an election, and if having more money and spending more money boosts your chances, this isn't really a true democracy. This is, you know, an oligarchy where money wins and anyone else, maybe they have a better message. Well, if they didn't have enough money, then uh, that doesn't matter because we, again, live in a capitalist system where everything has been commodified, including the democratic process itself. Now, on top of that, Bernie Sanders speechwriter David Sirota thinks that the timing of Bloomberg's entrance into the race says a lot. Quote, according to Sirota, the timing of Bloomberg's announcement lines up with Sanders' rise in the polls and a well-reported meeting between the media mogul and Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, one of the two wealthiest men in the world alongside Microsoft founder Bill Gates. Bloomberg is also close with Disney's Bob Iger, Sirota said. So what this is about is the elite class see that, you know, their go-to guy, Joe Biden, is failing and Pete Buttigieg might be surging, but I mean, they realize he's probably not going to win and uh, not just lose the Democratic Party primary, but if he were the nominee, he'd lose to Donald Trump. So they need a new horse to back, someone who can assure them that their tax cuts will, in fact, remain permanent. And, you know, they they want to make sure that the status quo isn't upset too much. So they want to stop Bernie Sanders and even Elizabeth Warren, albeit to a lesser extent, from winning. That's what this is about. They see that someone like Bernie or Elizabeth Warren is probably going to win. And Michael Bloomberg is their candidate sent in at the last minute to win. Now... What I want you to consider is not just the fact that Bloomberg himself is spending millions of dollars, but if you have your really rich friends like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos behind you, they could also potentially bankroll you, right? Spend even more money. Now, what his strategy is, is really, I, I think it speaks to how narcissistic billionaires are because he's choosing to basically swear off, um, you know, any type of campaigning in Iowa and New Hampshire, or not necessarily swear off, but forego campaigning there in hopes of really ramping up campaign efforts in states like Texas and South Carolina, states that are more delegate rich. Because if he doesn't get the momentum that candidates usually need from winning Iowa and New Hampshire, he's hoping that he could basically win this thing by winning the states with the most amount of pledged delegates. Now, he's doing this specifically by, you know, uh, running lots and lots of television ads. I mean, these ads are everywhere. You have probably seen it already. So, he's not trying to win by having a real grassroots, you know, ground game. He's winning just by flooding the media markets. And that really is shameful. That is absolutely shameful. And guess what? It's working. He's at 2.3%. So, the fact that he's already one of the top contenders in the top 10, it goes to show you that our democracy is broken and to even call it a democracy is incredibly charitable because this really isn't a democracy. To have a political system where a billionaire can not only buy his way into the race, but make himself actually, you know, in a position to win certain states, it's a downright disgrace. So everyone should look at this situation with disgust and realize that the fact that we have not one but two billionaires running in the Democratic Party primary, that speaks to the fact that we don't live in a democracy. We live in an oligarchy. And billionaires are no longer just funding elections by picking puppets to back. They're cutting out the middlemen and they're running themselves. That's disgusting. And uh, we're seeing democracy die before our very eyes, if you even want to argue that there's any life left in our democracy, in the state that it's in. It's it's a really sad thing to see, you know, see your country change for the worse and see the democratic process be commodified like other industries. You know, everything that shouldn't be a profit-driven venture is turned into a commodified game where rich people can jump in and game the process. It's sickening. I know a lot of people probably already saw the clip that I'm about to play for you, but I really want to talk about this because it just shows how awful of a candidate Joe Biden really is. And this isn't a surprise to anyone who's watching this show because we've covered his campaign throughout the course of the primary and he's bad. But I mean, I didn't know that he was this bad. I didn't know that he was willing to stoop 
to this low of a level. So to give you some background, he was confronted at a recent rally by an immigration activist who wanted him to commit to zero deportations and all deportations on day one using executive action. Joe Biden gets frustrated throughout the course of this confrontation and ends up telling him to vote for Donald Trump. Literally. Take a look. That over those eight years, there were three million people that were deported and separated from their families. Yeah. We had this classification of families. Well, you should vote for Trump. Families you should vote for Trump. And be, no, no, no. I'm no. I'm not going to do that. But I want to make sure that immigrant families and people like Sylvia are not afraid. And you have the power as a candidate to actually commit to stop all deportations from day one for executive action. And we want to hear you say that. I will not stop all deportations if you have a, if you commit a crime that's a felony. Not one more deportation. 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 Deportation. No, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. No matter what happens, somebody commits murder, they shouldn't be deported. I'm asking you a question. Someone commits murder. Look, you saw what happened. I know, but. I Okay. Look. There will be no family separations under my, under my, as, a, as a president of the United States. That's a lie. Let, let him go. Let him. That's a lie. That's a lie. All deportations that they want. All deportations. Deportations. Not one more. Deportations. Not one more. That was embarrassing. That was downright embarrassing. And if he had any shame left, he would drop out after that. You just told someone to vote for Donald Trump because he wanted to challenge you to do better. This is how Joe Biden performs under pressure. You crumble. You become unraveled. So imagine the way that he'd fare during a debate with Donald Trump. Donald Trump can say something that triggers him, and then all of a sudden he'd just melt down. He'd walk off the stage, possibly. I mean, you have to be an adult. You're running to be the president. You have to demonstrate to us that you have the temperament to be commander-in-chief. But you just told someone to vote for Donald Trump. That's embarrassing. That is fucking embarrassing. I don't even, like, there are no words to describe this. You just told someone who's an immigrant activist to vote for Donald Trump. How childish and petulant of you, Joe Biden. Shame on you. He then challenged the protester to say, well, you know, if somebody was murdered, should they not be deported? And he tried to really get him to answer that question as if the protester who was challenging him needed to answer because he's running for president. No, you're running for president. The protester is not running for president. You're running for president. You are the one who needs to come up with policy prescriptions for the problems that are impacting people, that are breaking apart families right now. And you were terrible. You and Obama had a horrible record of deportations. Not as bad as Trump, of course. But nonetheless, you still escalated after George W. Bush. Obama had the alien transfer exit program, which basically took immigrants and not just, like, deported them, but dropped them off somewhere randomly in Mexico, for example, where they were unfamiliar with, and this put them in danger, right? Because if you're unfamiliar with a particular area, you could be dropped off in a bad part of town where there is a lot of control from the cartel or gang violence, and you're literally endangering lives, but you're being cruel and doing that so that way you can deter others from coming to the country. That's what you and Obama did. 
So, I mean, that's why you're being challenged. But nobody can question Obama's legacy or his legacy. And when you do, that's what happens. Now, Bernie Sanders, I believe, has agreed to stop all deportations on day one because he acknowledges that you can use your executive action to make a difference. And we have to stop all deportations because our immigration system is broken. We're breaking apart families. We're locking children in cages. So we're overwhelmed and the system currently is not able to discriminate appropriately and determine who's a criminal and who's not. We're sending home people and breaking apart families and ruining lives. Dreamers are getting deported. People are getting deported to Afghanistan who have been in this country their whole life and they're dying. So for you to react that way and unravel Joe Biden shows that you shouldn't just lose. You've got to drop out. That's just embarrassing. Now, Bernie Sanders obviously capitalized on this and he tweeted about this saying, Joe Biden may not want the votes of those concerned about immigrant rights, but I do. Join our movement for justice. And that's exactly it. Joe Biden's loss is Bernie Sanders' gain because that was an absolutely embarrassing display and any other 2020 Democrat who's not capitalizing on this, I mean, what a missed opportunity. You have one of your rivals melting down at a minimal amount of scrutiny over a policy. And he tells him to vote for Donald Trump. Unbelievable. Unreal. Joe Biden is... He's not made for this. This is why he lost before when he ran for president. And this is why he's probably going to lose again. He's not meant for this. He doesn't speak to voters. I mean, what a way to communicate to people that you are fighting for them. And uh, you want their votes. Tell them to basically fuck off and vote for Donald Trump. Unreal. I want to take a look at an article published in NPR by Chris Arnold, who states what I think is pretty obvious. Canceling student loan debt would be great for the economy. Now, this isn't the first um, article that features an economist that talks about the benefits of student loan debt cancellation. Uh, I believe it was Market Watch that talked about this previously, but I mean, this is something that is obvious. If you eliminate that huge monthly payment that a lot of millennials have, of course, that increases their purchasing power. And as I've stated before, I would love to stimulate the economy and uh, buy more things if I didn't have to worry about this student loan debt that I currently can't foresee ever paying off. Like a lot of us take on this debt expecting to never pay it off and to have it until the day we die. And that means that we're going to have to make decisions. Like if you are a millennial, you may not be able to purchase a car or a house because you have what is basically a monthly payment that you will have forever that is as high as some mortgages. It's just, it's, it's unacceptable that our generation doesn't have the luxury of affordable college that the previous generation had. So of course, economists are seeing that this would be beneficial and they're talking about it. So let's get to the article here. Presidential hopefuls Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders want to tear up your student loans and set you financially free. That's popular among voters, especially those struggling to pay off this debt. Other Democratic candidates have more modest plans, but economists say the dramatic proposals from Sanders and Warren to free millions of Americans from the burden of student debt could boost the economy in significant ways and help combat income inequality. Warren would forgive up to 50000 for most people. Sanders would go further Further with total loan forgiveness, but with these plans, having a price tag north of $1 trillion, such legislation would come with plenty of risks. The reason debt forgiveness could have a big impact on the overall economy is that a generation of Americans is making major life decisions differently because of student loans. In the short term, it would be very positive for the housing market, says Lawrence Yoon, the National Association of Realtors chief economist. He says his group surveys show that student debt has people delaying home ownership by five to seven years. The effects would go beyond the housing market. William Foster is a vice president with Moody's, which just did a report on student debt forgiveness. There have been some estimates that U.S. real GDP could be boosted on average by $86 billion to $108 billion per year, which is quite a bit, he says. That's if you had total loan forgiveness. Foster says it wouldn't have to be total forgiveness to see significant results, and he says it could also help address rising income inequality. Foster 
says most of these loans are from the federal government and it could forgive them, but that would mean giving up the $85 billion in annual revenue it's currently collecting on these loans, and he says that would result in a wider fiscal deficit. Now, to put this into perspective for you, this is not some far-left activist economist. This is someone with a relatively conservative estimate about the impact that this would have on the economy because some of the risks that he talks about here, they're not even applicable to both Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren's plans. So he talks about a possible moral hazard where if we cancel student loan debt for this generation, then future generations are going to take on more student loan debt because they're going to expect their loans to be canceled one day too. Except the problem with that being a risk is that both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are proposing free college. So we're not just going to solve this problem for the current generation with student loans. We're going to make this a non-issue moving forward. Now, on top of that, he is correct that the student government does hold a lot of these loans. Now, yes, that will mean that they will be losing some revenue if they choose to cancel this. And he argues that they likely have to raise taxes to make up for that lost revenue, which means that working class people would likely have to pay higher taxes and they'd be effectively subsidizing the student loan debt cancellation of high income borrowers like doctors and, uh, and, and lawyers. But what Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are proposing is to raise taxes on elites, not working class Americans to pay for things like student loan debt cancellation. So even the pitfalls that he brings up are not applicable to these plans. The benefits are enormous. Canceling student loan debt would lead to a huge boost because, of course, if you have more money, you are going to spend that money. Unlike rich people, when working class Americans have money in their pockets, they spend it. But rich people, what do they do? They sit on that money. It doesn't get reinvested back in the, into the economy. So that's why trickle down doesn't work. But if you truly want the economy to grow, you have to make sure that we put money in the hands of working class Americans. Because increasing their purchasing power is better for everyone. We can actually buy the products that capitalists produce. So if capitalists want us to buy the shit they make, then they have to acknowledge that we need more purchasing power. Now they're already cutting our wages, they're already taking away retirement options, so this is really the least that they can do to make sure that we get a little bit of a break, right? You've got to go further, but this would obviously be huge. And not to mention the mental relief that this would uh, yield to a lot of people who are experiencing a lot of stress because having a lot of debt, I mean, that's incredibly stressful. I feel the stress of having a lot of debt. And when I think about it, it kind of freaks me out because, I mean, that's a lot of money to owe and a huge monthly payment that a lot of us, again, don't really foresee ever paying off. So these milquetoast solutions that centrists come up with, like Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg, of like capping the uh, percentage that you're paying each month, that's not good enough. Just cancel it. And Elizabeth Warren's plan, even though I credit her for pushing Bernie Sanders to do better here, her plan is not good enough. Just cancel it all because whichever way you choose to proceed here, if you go about this legislatively, then let's say you propose a bill and you want to cancel 50% of student loans. Well, when you end up Finishing negotiations, you're going to come away canceling like 25%. So if you don't go into the negotiations saying, I want to cancel 100% of student loans, you're not going to get what you want, right? So aim high and try to get the best that you can get. Um, don't undercut yourself before negotiations even begin. But still, Elizabeth Warren does get credit from me for proposing student loan debt cancellation because few candidates are even talking about this. Wayne Massam is actually the first to talk about this, but Bernie Sanders, he just he took that policy and made it better. And of course, this is what we need to do. This is why young people disproportionately support Bernie Sanders, enthusiastically so, because he's the only one that doesn't just care about us, but who has a plan that really would grow the economy in a substantial way. CNN hosted another voter panel. This one is from Iowa, and they're going to talk to people about the last Democratic Party primary debate, who they thought were their favorites. And they're also supposedly going to comment on who they believe should drop out of the 2020 race. Now, I used to enjoy these, but as the primary goes on, these are really starting to crush my soul because it, it, it kind of demonstrates how out of touch the average person is like it's evident that not everyone is going to be 
following the race super religiously, but I mean, the things that people say, it kind of just communicates to me that we're all screwed. Nonetheless, uh, let's watch it and then I will react as they kind of vocalize their thoughts on the race. It's going to be a bad one. If recent history is any guide, millions of Americans will have seen tonight's debate. Right now, though, we want to narrow it down to just nine. Nine men and women, all Democrats, all but two undecided. Their take on the candidates will set the tone and set it early because these... All but two undecided. It's November, almost December, and most of the people on this panel are undecided. That is... Uh, that's remarkable to me. I don't know how you're undecided at this point, but nonetheless... Uh, nine watch. voters live in Iowa. We first met them back in June. We're always glad to see them. They watched the debate tonight with our Gary Tuckman. Gary? Anderson, five months, five debates. We've been with the same group of loyal Democrats here in the reliably Democratic County of Johnson County, Iowa, home of the University of Iowa, each time. And we watched the debate together today. They were all undecided when we started. Two now have made decisions. We'll talk about that Based in a minute. Based on this but first, debate, tonight's debate, two made decisions. The first four. Fuck. Elizabeth Warren did the best among this group. Who had the best showing tonight, Roseanne? Klobuchar and Booker. Ed? Klobuchar. Klobuchar and Warren. Klobuchar. Klobuchar and Booker. Klobuchar. Booker. Booker and Warren. Scott? Booker and Buttigieg. Booker and Klobuchar. Klobuchar. And Klobuchar. Warren and Klobuchar. Warren and Klobuchar. Klobuchar and Booker. Klobuchar and Booker. All of these people, most of them, all but what, like two or three, think that Klobuchar had the best performance. I mean, I, I just, the very first comment, I think, really highlights it. Where do they find these people? I never met a Klobuchar supporter. Exactly. That comment right there has 1,100 thumbs up. Because I literally have never seen someone in the wild who supports Amy Klobuchar. Like, the people who I have talked to, even outside of my bubble, either support Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Pete Buttigieg, or Bernie Sanders. Basically, the front runners. But Amy Klobuchar, she's polling at 1.5%. So, I mean, like, is CNN deliberately finding people who like Amy Klobuchar? Because we know at that last debate that CNN moderated, they kept trying to prop up Amy Klobuchar, and MSNBC obviously tried to do the same thing. So, I mean, like, I don't know what's happening here, but people don't like Amy Klobuchar. She's going to get, like, nine votes, right? Nine votes, all of which are her family. Some of her family probably won't even vote for her because she's that boring. Her performance at this last debate was atrocious. Not to mention, she was shaking the entire time like a leaf. Like, you could see her hair, like, going back and forth because she was shaking. I don't know if she was nervous or sick. But, I mean, to say that Amy Klobuchar was good, like, I don't, I, I don't understand. Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. This doesn't make any sense to me. Either this panel is, like, all strategists or they work for Amy Klobuchar, or they're just completely weird people. Like, I, I'm putting on the tinfoil hat. This shit is too strange. Not that many people like Amy Klobuchar. This is, this is not normal. This is not an accurate sample of Democratic Party primary voters. Nobody likes Amy Klobuchar. Like, am I missing something here? Jesus, fuck. Amy Klobuchar did the best. People, what is wrong with you? It's like most of you, the highest number is Booker, Klobuchar second, Warren sounds like I can see Booker getting high, you know, marks from them because I thought he had a pretty good performance. Klobuchar did not have a good performance. I'm just going to go on an anti-Klobuchar rant, so we'll just watch it. The third here, and Buttigieg had one. One person said Buttigieg. One person said Buttigieg. Two people. First of all, why do you think Booker did the best? Who wants to tell us? He's the most inspiring. He's always working on talking about the issues in a positive manner, and he doesn't do any personal attacking. We didn't hear Biden or Sanders. You attacked two of the Biden. Runners. How come no one says anything about Biden or Sanders in a positive way after this debate? I don't think they really did anything differently than what we've seen in previous debates. How do you think Biden did, Malone? You you picked Biden the first debate. I think right, doing I the, best. the first debate, but I mean, for me, Biden was just a little off. I mean, he started um, mumbling on certain things, so I just kind of backed off. He's been doing that since day one, and Bernie Sanders did say things that are different. He made basically history by saying we should respect Palestinian human rights and dignity. Big issue right now, as we know. First thing that was mentioned during the debate. But an interesting point was Amy Klobuchar said our job is to look at each count when talking about impeachment. Kamala Harris said we have a criminal in the White House. Two very different approaches. Which was the How best approach? Different? in this debate. Well, Klobuchar, Klobuchar for sure. Klobuchar for sure. I just love Klobuchar. So you think that was too harsh with what, what 
Kamala Harris said about Donald Trump? We're still in a fact-finding mode right now. And, and, and I mean, the fact is, he, he's not a convicted criminal. That's, that's, exactly. that's a fact, right? right? Okay. But, I mean, but he's a criminal. Uh, but you think Klobuchar's approach is a better approach? Exactly. Oh, fuck if off. If they're going to be jurors, they need to at least come into it with an open mind looking at the evidence presented. Otherwise, in a normal jury trial, they'd be struck. So you think enough was mentioned about the impeachment issue during this debate? Yes. yes. What was the most important moment you thought during the debate? I think the conversation about acknowledging people of color throughout everything, not just during the election season. Yes, that was um, important. It came up multiple times. Yes. What do you think, Temple? I agree. I agree. Showing up, um, making sure that uh, they show up for black women, because black women um, have continuously showed up at the polls. Do you want to continue seeing yes, this? Yes, that is important, but yet they all are saying Klobuchar did really well. What did Klobuchar say that was so remarkable? I Like, I don't get it. People in the debates. No. no. You know, you're going to go to the Iowa caucuses on February 3rd. Is it okay if 10 or 12 people are still in the race? No. You want them to leave? I, I would prefer that they recognize that nationally it, it's just not their time. Like Amy Klobuchar, maybe? And to bow out so that the other candidates can have that opportunity. So like Amy Klobuchar? Drop out. Andrew Yang. What? Anyone else? Andrew Yang is polling higher than Amy Klobuchar, but you want him to drop out and think that she did good? Jesus, I like I do not get the logic here. What is the lot? There is no logic. This doesn't make any sense. Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah. 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 Also polling higher Stire. than Stire. Klobuchar. Final question for you. I was talking about you were all undecided when we started. Rosanna, have you made a decision? I have. You have. I am planning to uh, caucus for Amy Klobuchar. Uh. <laughs> Two hours later. Klobuchar, how about you, Ed? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. Privately, yes, but no, because... <laughs> Privately? Privately. <laughs> so we can't, we can't shake you to get it out of you. No. You're on a panel. Why can't you just say, Jesus Christ, did you not think that they'd ask you? I don't like any of these people. We're still advocating for mental illness plans. Okay, Scott, you're the Bernie husband. Bernie is supporting Medicare for all. That includes mental health care. It would be comprehensive, free at the point of service. People would get the care that they need, physical and mental. You have it on your shirt, but you don't seem to care about it. Like, I, I don't get pe I don't understand these people. Do, have you decided? That I have not decided. Do you know who she wants? I do. I can't tell you. Oh, boy. You're on a panel, you stupid idiot. God. <laughs> Rikisha? No. Okay. Now, Temple, you have a, have a sticker that says Warren on your red sweatshirt. You had decided Warren two debates ago. Yes. Have you changed your mind about her? I have not. So you, you're still with I her? I will still be caucusing for Warren. And Janice? Getting close. Not there yet. Not there yet. Okay, so most of our people still undecided. How you still you have a lot of time. But in a sense, it's dwindling because it is exactly 75 days into the Iowa caucuses. Anderson. And we're probably oh, five days. Uh, thank them so much for, uh, no, for being with us them. yet again. It's don't so nice that they don't came back. Don't them back. Jesus Christ. Um, that deserves a dislike. That was awful. I need to read some of these comments. Where do they find these people? I've never met Klobuchar supporter. Thank you. Cena trying to control the narrative on who we should vote for. I think you're just bringing in people who are stupid. <sighs> Yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that. Everything that they said, like usually you can find like some kernels of like truth to what they say, um, but uh, like there's no redeemable aspects of that panel. Like they said, the the one true thing that I agreed with was that they brought up black voters. Yes, Booker made a very powerful powerful point about that. Um, but then you go on to say Amy Klobuchar did a great job. Did she say anything about black voters? I don't know if she did. Uh, Booker made a really great comments about that andrew yang made a really powerful point about white supremacy i got tulsi gabbard said something that was good about that as well i can't remember her response off the top of my head but like the the logic here makes no sense they absolutely adore amy klobuchar but they think that andrew yang should drop out um when he's out polling her i just i don't understand this this makes no sense i can't help but think that the sample here is is flawed this is selection bias there's no other explanation because this isn't a representative sample of the average Democratic Party primary voter. Like, who, who, who likes Amy Klobuchar? Like, I genuinely want to talk to an Amy Klobuchar supporter. Like, I, I just don't get it. That was awful. Probably, no, definitely the worst panel that I've watched so far. I think that I need to stop watching these because it's making me lose faith in humanity. <laughs>
and I'm being fully honest, this is making me legitimately like question whether or not the species can survive if we have people with this type of logic. Yeah, I have nothing else to add to this. I'm just going to rant at this point, so we'll uh, go ahead and end the video. So on December 12th, there will be a general election that takes place in the United Kingdom. And basically, British voters are going to choose between the British equivalent of Donald Trump and the British equivalent of Bernie Sanders, Boris Johnson versus Jeremy Corbyn. Now, to be clear, their system is different in the UK. They have a parliamentary system and you don't vote for candidates. You vote for the party. But since Jeremy Corbyn is the leader of the Labour Party, if you vote for Labour and they win, well, he becomes prime minister if he gets a high enough percentage of seats to form a government. Um, now, the race that he is running is, it's brilliant. First of all, I love that the UK doesn't have multi-year long elections. They call an election and then it happens for a couple of weeks and then it's done, you can move on. But the campaign that Jeremy Corbyn is running, I mean, just from the perspective of a US political commentator, I can't not love everything that he's saying because Labour just put out a new manifesto and Jeremy Corbyn promoted this by putting out a video where he basically named as many policies as he possibly could within 60 seconds. And this is the type of substance that I wish we'd see more often in the United States. Like we see this with candidates like Bernie Sanders and AOC, but not often enough. But really what Jeremy Corbyn is doing is he's upping the bar, and I can't not share this because seeing this makes me genuinely excited about this election, even if it's not going to affect me directly. Big news. We've just launched our new manifesto. So I thought I'd take just 60 seconds to run through as many of the policies as I can. OK, 60 seconds starting now. 26 billion for our NHS, recruiting the doctors and nurses we need, a million new affordable homes to rent or buy with the biggest council house building program in decades. We'll give you the final say on Brexit within six months. We'll end NHS privatisation, bring down waiting lists and put patients first. We'll scrap university tuition fees, kickstart a green industrial revolution to tackle the climate emergency and create hundreds of thousands of new green jobs of the future. We'll build a national care service with free personal care for over 65s. The Fastest fibre optic broadband free for all, a sure start centre in every community. We'll protect the pension triple lock, protect the free bus pass, protect the winter fuel payment and protect the over 75's free TV licence. A real living wage of at least £10 per hour for all workers, boosting the pay of 7.5 million people, introduce a national education service, making world class education available throughout people's lives, more money for schools, reduce class sizes, and have public ownership of water, energy and Royal Mail. We'll double the spend on children's mental health and have a councillor in every school to take railways into public ownership. OK, my time's up. But that's only 60 seconds worth. There's 104 pages in here. A fully costed plan to transform Britain after almost a decade of cuts and neglect under Tories and Lib Dems. Take a look and decide for yourself. Boris Johnson's Tories, bankrolled by billionaires, or Labour, on your side, offering real change for the many, not just a few. Take care. See you soon. That was absolutely, positively brilliant. This is what really, I think, energizes voters. And in the last election, when he was up against Theresa May as party leader, he overperformed the polls. Nobody really thought that he would do that well, but it was because he ran a fantastically progressive campaign that was based on, you know, policy and not platitudes. And he did a phenomenal job. Now, what he talked about there is, you know, a green industrial revolution. Sounds kind of like a Green New Deal. Free fiber optic broadband for all. Increasing pay for workers. And he also said something that I think is really interesting. And NHS privatization. This should serve as a really important warning for us in the United States as we debate healthcare reform, right? Because a lot of people point out, when I talk about abolishing private insurance here in the United States, people point out, Mike, that's too far because every country, be it Australia or you know the UK, they have private insurance, right? But it's hurting them. In Australia, they open the door to more private insurance and people are complaining because costs go up when you do that. In the United Kingdom, about 10%, I wanna say, approximately of the market is private insurance and it's a constant battle 
to push back against further privatization. Whenever the, the Tories take power, they want to privatize more and more portions of the national health system that the UK has. So what I say to people in the US is, if you're starting over and you're reforming our healthcare, and it's kind of a misnomer to say that we're starting over because we're just expanding Medicare, but I digress. If we're starting you know, over in terms of reforming our healthcare system, don't start negotiations by saying we're willing to allow some form of private because when you do that, you are intentionally watering down your own public plan in order to preserve some role for private, in order to carve out you know, holes in our own system to give them something to do, as Adam Gaffney puts it. So we, of course, should not do that. Um, but I want to get back to the UK. I, I think that we have a lot to learn from Jeremy Corbyn and Labour. But basically, Boris Johnson is a clown. Not only does he look like Donald Trump, but he acts like Donald Trump. Although I will say, I think he's more intelligent and less unhinged than Donald Trump. Nonetheless, he's a far-right imbecile. But Labour put out an ad that really portrays this shift to the right that we're seeing everywhere. You know, in Brazil, in the UK, in France. And it portrays this xenophobia, this right-wing shift, in a way that it deserves to be portrayed. You know, um, and they do this in an ad that really makes fun of people who scapegoat immigrants, it makes fun of politicians specifically who scapegoat immigrants and tell you that all of your problems are because of immigrants. This ad is phenomenal. Please, please. One at a time. My daughter's school is falling apart and there's just not enough teachers to cope. My mother needs surgery and she's been waiting six months. I got made redundant and can't pay my rent, but there are no council houses. Look, I know you're all angry, but there is one simple explanation. It's all his fault. Huh? What's Sally got to do with my mother? Well, he's an immigrant. If we get rid of Ali, then medical waiting times will be shorter because we'll have more doctors. Actually, I, I am a doctor. But what about the services you've cut? Our schools? His fault. Housing? His fault. Hospitals? Look, whatever the problem is, it's because we don't have enough money. And we don't have enough money because we have to spend it all on Ali. What about the money you've just given to that guy? He's just the CEO of a major tech company that needed a tax break, don't worry about him. But if you need money, couldn't you just stop giving it to him? He clearly doesn't need it. You'd start giving it to schools and hospitals instead. Sorry, he's a job creator. He hasn't created any jobs around here. He isn't part of our community. Why would he care about us? I trust Sally more than him. Look, let me level with you. I would love to put more money into housing and healthcare and education, but my hands are tied. I have to give wealthy corporations massive tax cuts because... Because of Ali. Really? That was, that was so good. So they're taking this phenomenon that is immigrant scapegoating that we're seeing throughout the world as these far-right bigots emerge after Donald Trump's election, and they are making fun of it. That's the only way you can really talk about this, because if you truly believe that all of our problems emerge due to the presence of immigrants, then you are being duped by capitalists. You're being duped by people higher up on the economic chain than you who are trying to make you uh, pay attention to people with less money and less power and look away from them. So, I mean, I really, really hope that Jeremy Corbyn wins. He's running a fantastic campaign. Please vote for Labour if you're in the UK. Um, imagine a world where Jeremy Corbyn is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and Bernie Sanders is the President of the United States. Like, imagine the amount of change. Imagine the paradigm shift worldwide that we'd see. It would be remarkable, and I couldn't even imagine how much change would take place in that period of time where we kind of create this new consensus, internationally speaking, where we no longer do regime change wars, where we respect Palestinian rights. It would be amazing. So I truly, truly hope that he wins. If he doesn't win this election, 
He's going to be prime minister someday. Um, I just hope that it is sooner rather than later because I truly believe in his message and I, I hope he pulls this off. But he's running a great campaign, so I wouldn't be surprised if he overperforms the polls again. You know, overall, the Democratic Party may not necessarily be offering me any policies that I like, but the fact that they do all of these really cool dances, it shows me how hip they are as a millennial, and it makes me want to vote for them. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about, the Pete Buttigieg, High Hopes dance, whatever the fuck this is. Look, neoliberal centrists, they know that their policies suck, so the way that they try to make up for it and appeal to young folks is by coming up with these cringeworthy dances and the Pete Buttigieg High Hopes dance. That's not a new phenomenon. Like, back in the 90s at the Democratic National Convention, they were doing the Macarena, and yes, it was just as cringy then as these types of idiotic dance routines are now. You know, it shows that the people working for them, even though they're trying to have fun, it just comes off as overly culty to me, and I, I just hate it. And they have a way of making songs that are popular that people wouldn't otherwise really listen to hate these fucking songs with a passion. Now, in 2016, it was the fight song. Hillary Clinton had the fight song at every rally, and I absolutely hate that song. I still hate that song. It's one of the worst songs I think ever created. But now, the High Hope song, I think because it's accompanied with a dance, it's 10 times worse. Like, it's exponentially worse. Um, it's just, it's just so stupid. Like, you don't need a dance to appeal to young folks. All you need are policies, and that's how you're going to get people on board. You're not going to demonstrate how hip and cool you are by doing these dumbass dances. You're going to make us hate you more because it shows how out of touch you are. Because if you think that this is what's going to appeal to youngsters, well, that in and of itself showcases how out of sync you are with the Democratic electorate, namely young people. So, of course, since I hate all of these dances, I asked my patrons, what do you hate more, the fight song or the high hope song, which I think, objectively speaking, is one of the worst songs ever created. Objectively speaking, not subjectively, objectively speaking. <laughs> you can you can figure out some scientific way to measure how shitty songs are, and... Um, High hopes would be near the top of that list. So, <laughs> between the fight song and the Buttigieg high hope song, uh, my patrons were very clear. Um, they hate Pete Buttigieg's high hope song way more than the Hillary fight song. Three times more, as a matter of fact. So, you know, this poll isn't surprising. I'm glad that they hate it as much as I do. But let's look at some of the comments, because I think that they really, you know, um, describe the situation well. Stephanie says, listen... To me, white people who get roped into dancing for a candidate is less cringe than organizing celebrities to sing a song designed to manufacture hype and good vibes for a candidate they were shoving down our throats as, quote, the best. Audio Guy says, Centrists shouldn't be allowed to access the arts. You need soul for that. Once you've sold your soul to the oligarchs, like their moral compass, your musical tastes can only point to shit. Tony says, I hear the High Hope song at work and it makes me want to throw up. And now that Pete uses it, I hate him even more. Karen says, Hillary sucks. Watch it, Karen. You better watch how you speak about the queen. Borgon says, where's the survey for best campaign song ever? Because even though I thoroughly dislike Donald Trump, his song, The USA Freedom Kids, the official Donald Trump jam is completely awesome. You could not create a better anthem for the alternate reality of our totalitarian present. It's like Stalinist realism, but for American conservative kid pop music. Deal from strength or get crushed every time. Liz says, Buttigieg equals cringe, Hillary song equals cramp. Garrison says, definitely Buttigieg. So, I mean, there you have it. I think that people on the left are in unanimous agreement that Pete Buttigieg's high hope stance is not only stupid, but it makes me hate Pete Buttigieg even more. Like, I, I know, like, maybe I've just become way too cynical um, because that's what politics has done to me, covering it this closely now for multiple years. But I hate it so much. It, it just, it, it's weird, it's robotic, it's culty, and it's cringeworthy. More than anything, it's cringeworthy. So, um, yeah, it seems like people agree with me, and for good reason. It's kind of stupid, and Pete Buttigieg's team should stop doing it. But if they're not, then every time we see a video of it, we should definitely go out of our way to point out how silly they look, because it is, um, it's really fucking stupid. <laughs> It is. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be a dick, but um, sorry, not sorry. It's fucking dumb. Stop doing it. 
My name is Zenas Bazakis. I'm a mom, an activist, an entrepreneur, and I want to be your next congresswoman. I never thought about running before. I was going to handle things from the business side or as an activist. But when I read that we only have about a decade left to save our planet, I couldn't just sit there. I needed to act. That's why I'm getting to work now. Strong corporate interests, lobbyists, political machines fight every day against the policies that we need to enact in Congress. Like the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, common sense gun control, campaign finance reform, criminal justice reform, student loan relief, and equal rights. All these policies will help make America more prosperous, more just, and more secure. It sounds audacious, but we have the ideas, we have the courage, and we have the political will. So will you join our movement to create a better New Jersey and a better America? Yeah! Therein, are you? Hello everyone, I'm here with Zena Spizakis running in New Jersey's 9th Congressional District against incumbent Bill Pasquale, and she was just recently endorsed by brand new Congress. She was highly recommended by fellow New Jersey and progressive Russ Cirincione, and she is here to talk about her campaign. Zena, thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real honor. I'm looking forward to it. Should be fun. I'm very excited. And when we kind of first connected, we got news that a uh, brand new Congress had endorsed you, which is really exciting. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you attended. There was like a, a brand new Congress training session or whatnot. Did you attend that? And how did that I, go? Yeah. So? It was actually this. It was I just got back last night. It was this weekend. And uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, except for like maybe one, all of the candidates that they've endorsed were there from around the country, uh, including a couple of senatorial candidates, which is new for them this year. So it's not just the House of Representatives, but, you know, we're going to we're going to change the face of uh, the Senate, too, because if we need to get anything done, we need to have both houses uh, change. But it was it was exciting. It was uh, it was uh, it was a nice it felt it felt like this is really what the future ought to be like. It was a diverse group, lots of different backgrounds, uh, a, a number of non-native born naturalized citizens running as well. I mean, it was just it was just beautiful to behold. And everybody's coming at it from a different perspective. I'm coming at it from a, you know, sort of a clean energy perspective. Other other people coming at progressive values via, via mass incarceration or whatever else. But it was uh, I felt like if we put like all these people in one room or one in one house, uh, we could actually get a lot of a lot of things done uh, as well. Uh, and the other thing that you should know about brand new Congress, none of their candidates take any corporate money. I mean, they've sworn off of it. We don't want that influence in our campaign or in our legislating. So, um, so yeah, it was uh, it was great actually. Yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, I saw the pictures and it was like I know this sounds corny, but it was like super heartwarming because I've been talking <laughs> to these candidates and you know it. I, I'm a I'm a fairly cynical person. I think a lot of people who follow American politics closely, mm -hmm. it's easy to get cynical. But seeing everyone from like all different walks of life across the country kind of rise up. It really tells you that like something is happening here. And one thing that I think is is very clear about all the brand new Congress and not just brand new Congress and Justice Democrats, but anyone who is progressive who's running is there's kind of this like core, you know, um, ideology, this commitment to like Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, you know, student loan debt cancellation and whatnot. But each person, as you kind of alluded to, they're all approaching this from different angles. So for you, one thing that I really noticed is you have this really strong emphasis on uh, a Green New Deal and basically saving the planet from climate catastrophe. And in your bio, you you talk about how you kind of approached this previously from, you know, the business world. And also part of your inspiration is you have two elementary age children, which yeah. is obviously going to affect their future. So talk about why climate change is kind of the issue that you're choosing to make front and center. I think it's obvious to everyone, but I think it's really nice to hear it like from you, why it matters to you. Yeah, well, you know why it matters to me. Obviously, uh, my children, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know everyone's children. Really, really, anyone being born into this world is they're not going to have the same, you know, childhood I have. I mean, I'm in the weird, uh, the weird generation where I remember what it was. Like. I'm probably the last generation. Now I'm aging myself, right? I'm in my 40s, but I'm, <laughs> I'm the last generation to actually remember what it was like prior to the prior to the climate crisis. I'm in the first generation to really feel it, and I'm the only. We're in the only generation to really do anything about it. And so, you know, I was. I've been an environmental activist. Um, I, you know, I worked. 
Uh, I'm working, our company is a clean energy startup. Um, and I thought I was kind of doing my part until I read the UN's IPCC report last year, which um, IPCC stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and it's basically a collection of the world's best scientists telling you, well, you've got to cut your emissions by about half in the next 12 years. Otherwise, you know, run away, right? Uh, runaway greenhouse, greenhouse effect. And the thing that terrified me about that, Mike, wasn't the 12 years necessarily, is that I study climate models. I mean, I'm getting a graduate degree in energy policy and climate science. Uh, and every single climate model that I've ever looked at has completely overestimated the amount of time in which we have to react. So that 12 years to me was something more like, it, I don't know, I'm making this up, five or six. It's, it's going to be a lot shorter than what they think it is. It always has been because there are things that are happening to our climate that scientists can't really predict. We've never been, we've got no way of modeling what's hap happening out there. Um, and scientists, by the very nature, are conservative. You know, they don't want to go crazy with their predictions. And so they've been completely off the mark. Things are happening faster uh, than we expected. And, you know, I, as a mother, I, I, I just... I can't, you know, I, I read that report and I so, sort of looked at my income, my, I'm in a safe blue district, right? It's a D plus 16. And I'm like, what has he done on climate? Nothing. Um, in fact, he even pushed, voted a couple times to push the Keystone, Keystone pipeline forward. Um, and I would just, I understand this might not be his expertise and I don't expect him to be studying energy policy or anything like that. But, you know, part of leadership is to actually put a voice to something even if it might be politically inconvenient. And to be quite honest, they can't, you know, no one in the House of Representatives or in, con or in the government, frankly, can claim that they've been ignorant to this. Congress gets regular reports called national climate assessments. They've known about this. And in fact, New Jersey, where we're from, it's expected and it's happening now. It's going to get wetter, faster, and warmer, twice, uh, twice as warm, faster than the rest of the United States. And that's happening right now. I mean, we had Superstorm Sandy, things are flooding. I mean, it's just we, we haven't had a good snowfall since my since my son was a baby. Um, so I just I said, there's no way. I mean, I, this is something that's my life's work, but this is how I have to take it up to the next level because what I was doing was not moving the needle fast enough. And in order to protect our children, uh, I needed to do this. Uh, I needed to step up. So that's yeah, and I think it's really important that you give us your background because you have the expertise here and you've been looking at the data. And that IPCC report, I think it really put it into perspective for a lot of people. Um, myself included, you know, to where we, we kind of we've been putting this in the back of our minds, realizing that it's a crisis, but not really knowing how little time we have. And it's so important because, as you said, you know, scientists, they are by their very nature conservative. They're not going to come out with claims that are hyperbolic to get you to pay right. attention. That's not the way that they do That's, things. No. Um, so it's really important that we take things into our own hands and we really we understand the sense of urgency and really the 12 year timeline, as you said, it really isn't great. I mean, there are some there's one model that predicts that human extinction, if it's going to happen, will start by 2050. That is insane. It's, uh, you know, I think we're, we're losing, I don't know how many species a day. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not going to even start quoting about, you know, what's happening in the penguin populations or anything like that. But what, what happens with these extremes in weather is, uh, and we saw some of, some of this starting uh, in India and in the Saudi Peninsula this summer, um, plants get stressed out. They're a living organism and they get stressed out. And after a while, if you have these huge swings in weather, it weakens the plant and the plant will not be able to grow food. If the plant can't grow food, we can't feed our lifestyle, we can't feed ourselves, it starts. Food prices start skyrocketing and it becomes, it becomes an environment, the, the climate crisis is an environmental justice issue. I mean, it, it, in so many, so many ways, you know, even, even here in this country, we think, oh, it's not really going to hit our shores. Our wealth is not going to protect us. Yeah. It won't. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming for us. And, you know, there, I, I like to give the example last summer um, um, in India, there were, uh, temperatures in part of India had reached so such high degrees, uh, that entire villages were abandoned because, uh, you know, well, the livestock was dropping dead because it was too hot. Plants were dying because after a certain temperature, I mean, your plant's going to die. Um, water dries up and there's no food and you had climate migrants. Okay. We have, we've seen hurricane was a Dorian that hit, uh, just the Bahamas, um, uh, near us. We had a climate. We had a whole ship full of climate migrants hitting Florida, and what did we do? I mean, the Trump administration, of course, sent them away. I mean, predictably. Yeah. But that's gonna. If you look at the entire planet, the equatorial regions of our planet is going to ca cause hundreds of millions of people to be displaced. They're not going to head south. They're going to head north. They're going to head north into into the U.S. into Canada. They're going to head north into Europe. 
uh, and into Russia. And you can imagine what kind of conflict you're going to see uh, when that when those people start finally. I mean, we couldn't handle the refugee crisis coming out of Syria, which some people claim had some environmental effect, you know, some sort of environmental impetus to it. Um, I haven't seen this. I haven't seen the data yet, but uh, there there are those claims. We couldn't handle that. We can't handle what's happening at our border right now. You know, uh, you know, it's yeah. not. Um, if I if I'm a farmer, if I'm a, a head of a household, and I can't feed my children, I'm going to migrate, Absolutely. and nothing's going to get me. I mean, I mean, you're a parent. I get it. Um, and it's that's not the world I want to leave my kids. Um, it's not the world any kid should really uh, inherit. Um, and it just it just it's so angering. It's angering for me because because we've known about it for such a long time. We've known about it. I mean, in, since since in my lifetime, right? And the, 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 we've had half of the world's emissions come in the last 25 years. That's been most of my life. We've had, it's, we can stop this now. And the thing that gets me, Mike, is that we actually have the technology. We have like the vast majority of the technology we need right now to deploy it. You know, I, um, I'll go back to Bill Pascrell. He actually endorsed the Green New Deal about a week after I announced and got some positive presses like this environmental activist is going after Pascrell, which is, okay, coincidence, Okay, take it as it is. He endorses it. He pays lip service to it. Activists in New Jersey ask him to come out with a statement for like at least, you know, a statement on a moratorium of new fossil fuel projects, which isn't a hard thing to do. Because, I mean, heck, we're building some, one of the largest uh, wind farms off the, sh- off the coast of uh, New Jersey right now. We can replace we can replace that energy generation. These wind farms don't take long to come up. They take, they're less than a year to build these things. I mean, it's not, it's not like you're building a nuclear power plant, which will take, which takes like 10 years. Um, we have that, but you know, where, where, where's the leadership, right? Where's the voice to it? I mean, why does a mother who is perfectly, you know, is perfectly happy, you know, <laughs> trying to, trying to get her company to like start producing, you know, clean electricity from hydrogen gas. That was our start. That's our startup. You know, why, why am I jumping into this race? Because, because of this negligence, it's criminal negligence. It is, it is, it is the biggest intergenerational human rights violation, frankly, ever. I mean, it's my children. These guys are going to be long gone out of office by the time my six year old is going to have to deal with food shortages. You know, I mean, he's, and, 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 and I come from like, I come from a privileged background. I am, you know, I live in a good neighborhood. I've got a good house, but what happens to the pe- to folks who, who, you know, who don't have my advan- advantages such as ours, frankly, advantages that are found in the United States, you go to the rest of the world and it's, it's, it is, we will, ki- these people will die. These people will die. I can't, I can't allow that. I can't allow that. Who yeah. would, right? Who, uh, no good person. I, I'm sorry. I'm going on about this, but it gets no, really, you're, you're uh, absolutely, well I, I yeah. love the way that you're talking about this. And I actually want to go a little bit deeper because um, we, we oftentimes talk about climate change mitigation and adaptation, finally, um, in terms of the Green New Deal. But this is a resolution. Yeah. So there's a lot of neoliberal pro-corporate Democrats who can endorse the yeah. Green New Deal, but not necessarily <laughs> explain what they think that means. Now, candidates are filling in what they mean by the Green New Deal. Um, right. But I want to talk to you because you know more about this than most people, I think, running for Congress. What does true mitigation and adaptation look like? Uh, in terms of policy, like what would you do that you think would actually suffice? Because there's people who are proposing things, but none of them either meet the deadline or they're not ambitious enough. And I think that the Green New Deal is the first right. time I'm hearing people talk about, you know, meeting the urgency, meeting that IPCC's deadline. But what do you think we need to do just if politics weren't an issue? If politics were an issue, uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, uh, just pass a moratorium on all fossil fuel, any new fossil, first, any new fossil fuel projects need to be stopped. Um, and any, um, and, th- and then we start looking at the fossil fuel projects and start looking at their emissions and start, start knocking down like the, any coal fire plants need to be decommissioned. Those workers need to be trained to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, transition into a green job, whether that's building wind, turbines or uh, maintenance on those wind turbines, putting up, you know, putting up rooftop solar, whatever. Well, we can, um, 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 those are good, you know, at least in the wind industry here in New Jersey, some of these companies that have been coming in are very pro-worker. These are like, you know, good union jobs. 
uh, that should be done first of all. More, just keep it in the ground. That's 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 a just a non-starter right there. Um, uh, research uh, the the I'm sorry the financial subsidies right now. The uh, depending on the study that I read, anywhere between fifteen and twenty billion dollars still go of our taxpayer money still goes to this day to fossil fuel companies as financial incentives, subsidies, tax breaks, whatever, financial incentives. Um, those need to stop. <laughs> I mean, it's a 200-year-old industry. They don't need any support. I mean, I work, so I'm paying for these guys to line their pocket and pollute the air that my children uh, are breathing. So that, that, just to give you an example, I mean, that's what it is, really. Uh, bought and paid for, right, by ExxonMobil. Um, those need to stop, and those need to be completely f- redirected into um, um, uh, either financial incentives to uh, adopt green technologies faster, whatever those may be, or if they need to be uh, deployed into research and development. That's the second thing. Third thing, and this has been used uh, with great effectiveness in other countries, and it hasn't been actually that politically controversial, is efficiency standards. What we're doing to Cal- so California has its own efficiency standards, and the Trump administration is trying to go after them for that exemption. In other words, they can't. California has been a driver in a lot of the efficiency standards around the country because if you want to sell into California, you know, you got to be a good player. And that's been driving a lot of technology um, around the country. And so now the Trump administration wants to say, no, California, you can't do that anymore. You know, they're all for states' rights <laughs> until it comes to like energy efficiency. You can't do that anymore. Um, and they're, so they're taking them to court, uh, is where I believe it is. Um, efficiency standards need to put in. And then really uh, a lot, uh, we really need to um, uh, build resiliency in some of these communities. Um, there are, uh, depending on the model that you see, as far as uh, sea level rise, uh, there are a lot, uh, many parts of this country and millions will be affected by sea level rise. Those communities, there's some, there, it was, uh, Florida, for an example, Florida is built on limestone. You really can't build a wall around Florida and hope to keep the water out of it because limestone acts as a sponge and comes in through the geology of the state. So those communities either need to be uh, uh, something, the building codes need to change. They need to be building higher up. I don't know. Um, uh, Superstorm Sandy hit here in New Jersey. Um, it knocked out power, uh, for many of these communities for quite a long time. And that's because the surges that came in, you know, they hit these substations and these substations are not really designed to handle 15 foot, you know, tides coming in on a consistent basis. That sort of, that sort of resiliency. And really it's an infrastructure spend because our infrastructure was developed for a fossil fuel economy, right? And it was developed for no climate change. Uh, and we, sp- we spend like a fraction of it. We spend, I think it was two or 3%, I wanna say, don't quote me, it's somewhere around there that we spend just on, just on infrastructure maintenance, just to maintain our bad infrastructure, which uh, you know a lot of civil engineers will tell you needs help. China, China, China spends somewhere around 8% of its GDP on infrastructure. They're building a green economy. Europe is building a green economy. And in fact, actually, you know, they're um, in a lot of their industries and in a lot of their economies, the Europeans and the Chinese, I would say, are almost 10 years ahead of where we are, or where we should be. And we should be leading this. I mean, right, right now, um, within five years, my prediction is they will be the number one manufacturer of wind turbines. They are already uh, number one in solar, um, thin solar film. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, so it's a, it's a matter of like, it's a matter of stopping the bad stuff, shifting some of those resources into the good stuff, and then helping communities adapt to what's coming. Because even if we stopped all emissions right now, uh, the way the physics works is that there's going to be a certain amount of warming in the atmosphere. So things are going to get worse before they get better. And I tell people, we can't really reverse it in my generation. We won't. We won't. The, the, this next election, and you can quote me on this, this next election comes down to whether we want to see the worst effects in the next uh, 30 years or if we want to slow it down enough that we see effects like in the next 500 years and allow for our children and grandchildren's generation to come up with solutions uh, to their energy needs and to really just draw it back out of the air. You know, longer term, longer term, there's a lot of things you could do with land management and forestry management that allows for natural processes to start pulling some of these, um, some of the carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, but, um, you know, if I, if I had one thing to do right now, um, you know, carte blanche, no politics involved, I would, um, and this is going to be a little controversial, but I would shut down every methane pipeline, uh, in the country. I just, and I'll tell you why, um, 
even a two percent, even a two to three percent leak in a methane pipeline, because methane as a molecule is so much more powerful at warming the planet. Uh, even a tiny little a fractional link from any one of these little joints anywhere on these thousands of miles of a pipeline is no better than a fossil fuel plant as far as its warming effects. And you know, people are wondering, well, why is it? Why you know, we're kind of curbing our we are kind of curbing our CO two emissions. You know, in the last three years. The uh, the GDP of the United States has completely decoupled from our uh, from our CO2 emissions. So when people tell you, oh, you know, we can't have economic growth and lower our emissions, that's bullshit because it's <laughs> it decoupled three years ago. Um, but what we're still seeing is these methane spikes in the air. And there are people like, where are these coming from? They're coming from these pipelines. And there's no way anybody can audit thousands of miles of pipeline. And if you have like the... Uh, uh, pipeline, you know, uh, companies, uh, the methane companies, um, or uh, the natural gas pipe uh, companies, I should say, auditing themselves. It's like the chicken and you know, the the uh, I'm sorry, the fox watching the chicken, the chicken coop, you know. Um, anyway, but yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's those three things. Um, yeah, I, and I love the, the way that you simplify that. And what you focus on, um, which is important, is adaptation and mitigation, um, because you know we we can do what we can to stop climate crisis, but regardless, people. They need to realize that climate change is inevitable, a certain degree of it. It's just a matter of what we can control in terms of how bad yeah. that disaster will be. So we have to mm -hmm. arm ourselves with the capability to adapt. Now, you mentioned, you know, um, natural ways of removing the CO2 from the atmosphere. One thing that a viewer brought to my attention recently that I'm not too familiar with, yeah. and I'm not sure if you are too, is a way to um, artificially remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Is that technology that's there yet that's viable what is your take so, on so yeah so yeah I, I have read a, a little bit about this technology so um so natural processes aside uh, aside in other words you know put aside the fact that we need to plant i don't know a billion trees yeah um there is so co2 i'm gonna get a little technical on you a little bit here uh co2 is a really hard thing to pull out of the atmosphere because the molecule the, that co2 molecule doesn't really react with a lot of things you know, I mean, it's not like I can throw a chemical out there. The CO2 is going to react with it and it, it draws it down. It's not really reactive. Um, but there is there are some technologies uh, that are being developed, um, which basically which are basically uh, there's uh, there's one company out in um, uh, the northwest uh, in the Canadian border. I forget its company. I think it's called Carbon Engineering or something like that. But they they basically have found some sort of a process. It's expensive right now. Uh, to pull the CO air out of the air, and 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 there there's a few companies working on this. They've all kind of got their tweaks on the same sort of basic principle as far as the chemical reaction is concerned. Um, but it's uh, it is um, I forget uh, the article I was reading, but I was reading an article about this about how many of these actual plants at our current technology we need to deploy around the world to actually start making a dent, and it was in the order of tens of thousands. And these wow. plants would not be cheap to build. Um, that we need to put money into this R and D. Uh, yeah. This is not this is not carbon capture and sequestration, where like you you know you get some natural gas guy saying, oh you know I can still keep burning it, but I'll just carbon capture and sequester it. I'm like that that technology where they say clean coal, clean coal's a myth. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it is it is uh, very expensive and not really viable, uh, and it would your electricity rates would would spike if they started doing that on mass. But um, it's uh this requires research and development um, from the federal government. I mean, it's um, it, there is something there. It okay. just needs work. Yeah, that's so. good. Sorry to put you on the spot because I know that this is super complicated, but this is something that kind of piqued my interest because any little like thing that I could grab onto that gives me a little bit more hope, I'm trying yeah. to grab and find. So <laughs> that too. was something that was a little bit interesting to me. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> so you you have a really robust platform. I don't want people to think that you're just the climate change candidate, but you, you speak about this in such an amazing and just beautiful and simplistic way that helps us to understand it that I really wanted to pick your brain about this because you know so much that, you know, whenever we have a resource like you around, I, I want to I want to. <laughs> capitalize on that but with that being said of course i want you to talk about this campaign the dynamics of your campaign because you are going up against a democrat who has co-sponsored and endorsed or whatever the green new deal <laughs> right. but we all know that you know that was due to public yeah. pressure because he has a primary challenger so talk a little bit about the differences between you and bill press Pasquale, because this is someone who I think is obviously an establishment figure he takes a lot of corporate money and explain why he is not the person that we need at this time when we're trying to literally save the planet. Well, you know, um, uh, so outside of, outside of like climate 
issues. Um, a large part of my of my district, uh, if you look at sort of the statistics, is uninsured. Um, uh, as as far I mean, as compared to the rest of the state of New Jersey, um, m- one of my other sort of very personal issues is Medicare for all, uh, because my uh, father, who was a small business, an immigrant and a small business owner, never had medical insurance, refused to go to the doctor, died very young. Uh, I'll leave it at that. It is an issue that's personal to me. Uh, it is an issue that is personal to a lot of my constituents. I I go out canvassing and I hear about. I mean, I just heard a story from a young woman who said her mother is going blind. Her mother, who is a truck driver, is going blind because she doesn't have good insurance, and so therefore she's going to lose her livelihood. Medicare for all is something that this community needs. Um, not not only because it's a very sort of polluted community uh, along the Passaic River. Um, and even the air pollution here in this part of New Jersey gets an F from the, uh, from the American Lung Association. Uh, but it is something that is, I mean, aside from the moral aspect of it, you know, so that's where I come from. And if you look at, cause I've got an MBA, right? I have to look at it from like the, uh, <laughs> from the economics aspect of it. It is a three and a half trillion dollar industry that is growing at roughly five to 6% a year. Okay. That is. Gr- very quickly grows to about a $50 billion industry in um, 15, 20 years. Anyway, it gets very big, very fast. One third, roughly one third of that three and a half trillion dollars is spent in a- overhead, overhead. Okay. It is, it is, if you look at it from a purely business perspective, I'm like, that's ripe for disruption. Why is there so much fat in the system? So, and we pay, I mean, I'm not going to go into the statistics. I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're getting sicker. We're paying more and we're getting sicker. It doesn't work. Simply we cannot, it is unaffordable to keep our health insurance, our health care system as it is right now, completely unaffordable because it's going to grow into a monster and it's going to take an ever increasing share of our GDP, which is crazy. That's crazy. I mean, it's going it, to, it's, I mean, it's not quite the military budget yet, but you know, it's going to, it's getting, a, it's getting that big. Um, you know, I, I, it, and I personally have like a, a big sort of ethical issue with, an industry whose sole motivation is profit, and the only way they can do that is to raise prices on you and deny you coverage. I had a friend of mine whose mother died of cancer because she couldn't afford one pill a month was twenty five hundred dollars, and her insurance company said, "No, uh, we're not going to approve of that." And I'm like, and she died. I mean, do they care? <laughs> she died. You know, you know, it's like, oh, then people ask me, well, what about the ACA? So the ACA was a good starting point, you know, got the conversation going. But frankly, I mean, if you look at medical bankruptcies before the ACA and after the ACA, they're the same. It hasn't made a dent in medical bankruptcies. Um, and there's still 28 million people uninsured. It's just um, that there's um, yeah, obviously immigration reform is a big issue for me. I believe in a pathway to citizen uh, citizenship, whether you're here documented or undocumented. Uh, another personal issue for me because my my parents are immigrants um, and my parents uh, were sponsored by my uncle who uh, came here years ago. Um, um, basically was, he worked as a merchant Marine and basically jumped one of the ships that he was working on and came here. I don't know what it was, forties or fifties, uh, as an undocumented immigrant. Right. And he's, he, you know, married somebody, became a citizen, whatever. And then he sponsored my parents over. So I have this whole, you know, and, and if you look at sort of the uh, cr- criteria that the Trump administration, it, it's sort of this merit-based stuff, right, that they're trying to do. And I'm like, I look at my parents and I'm like, my father was a high school dropout. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't think he would have made anything. You know, I mean, that's not even a criteria. I think we want immigrants. We want, we, can you imagine the, the courage it takes for somebody to come to a country where they don't know anybody, have no money, and they don't know the language? That takes a certain type of personality. And that's the type of personality that, frankly, I think we need. Um, you know, agree with me or not, but, uh, those are sort of my, my big three issues, um, climate change, uh, Medicare for all and, uh, uh, and immigration. Um, and I will say one last thing, Mike, um, I've been trying to get this into, uh, uh, to get this out a little bit more. Not every Democrat is the same. And I'm happy criticizing my own Democratic Party. And even even in my run here in, in, in the state here, it's it's a plus 16 district. But frankly, the biggest obstacles have come to me from what, uh, from the Democratic Party. They've denied me access to resources that I need to campaign, whatever. I've had to 
I've worked around it because I've, I've built and run businesses for 20 years. I can do this, whether they throw these obstacles at me or not. But it's not when you walk into a voting booth and you see Democrat, you better you better be certain that they're a defending the planet and b working for you and not their corporate benefactors. Because, you know, I call I call some of these guys climate delayers. They're delayers. And and people are shocked when I say, you know what? I'd rather deal with a climate denier because at least I know that they're going to deny it. But if I vote for a Democrat and he delays action, I'm voting for you so my so I don't have to worry about my kids' future in 10 years time. But what have you done? I mean, it's just it's very irritating to me. So Yeah, you know. no, that rage is felt by millions of people across the country. I mean, there's a reason why um, independent has become the largest political party, you know, in America. And it's not a party, but just people identify more as being independent than Republicans right. and Democrats, because, you know, the two party duopoly isn't working because they've both largely been captured by, you know, private interests. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's why we have people dying and going bankrupt because they don't have health care. That's why we haven't had action on climate change. I mean, yeah. the fossil fuel in industries, they fund Republicans and Democrats, one party sim simply just denies it. The other party delays it, as you said. And yeah. the climate delay <laughs> is perfect. I think that's the perfect moniker for them yeah. because it really is true. I mean, if, if you're not going to get in there, then just the mere fact that you acknowledge the reality of anthropogenic climate change, that's not enough. Like, we need action yesterday. And yeah. the fact oh. that people are still not even, like, willing to, you know, co-sign on the Green New Deal in Congress, yeah. in the Democratic Party. It's mind blowing to me, and oh. for them to only do it when they get a challenger. I mean, we've wasted. We've wasted. We, has it been ten months, eleven months since they uh, since the Green New Deal? We've wasted ten months. Ten months at this point of of our emissions is a freaking lifetime. Okay, if I don't understand why it's not an all hands on deck thing, and quite honestly, we're we're talking about transitioning to an economy that is decarbonized, sustainable, just. For every American, regardless of wh who they are, where they came from, or who they love, this Green New Deal—it's not one issue. It's everything. It is everything. I mean, we—it's—it's—it's. It's, it's, you're dealing with so many social justice issues, health issues. I mean, energy issues, infrastructure issues, technology issues. Who does America want to be in the 21st century? Do we want? Because I can tell you, this this race is is going by us, and if we don't get on board, we're going to lose. Are we going to continue to be the technological and economic powerhouse that we were in the 20th century? That's what I think we should be. And I think because we have we have intelligent people, we have immig we have you know a lot of, a large part of our, uh, our population descended from these immigrants who have this fight and this ingenuity quite frankly and resourcefulness in order to come to a country like this you know and it's it's who do we want to be as a country that's your choice in the next election you know yeah. can you handle the can you handle the critical issues of the 21st century or do you want to stay as business as usual because i can tell you business as usual is not working yeah yeah and yeah. to quote aoc like we will pay for climate change oh. um regardless of if we take action or not it's just a matter yeah. of like actually arming ourselves to deal with it through, you know, a Green New Deal and mitigation and adaptation is going to be a lot lower of a price than not doing anything, you know, about climate change. So, look, anyone who's watching this, I know is going to feel inspired. I feel so inspired by your campaign and love everything that you're saying. Tell us what we can do if we want to help you uh, donate, volunteer. Where can we go and how can we help you win? Uh, well, uh, uh, we're they might outspend us, but we're going to out organize them, as AOC said. Uh, we are uh, actively recruiting uh, volunteers to do uh, call banking, text banking, um, and also canvassing. Um, and we're also obviously um, uh, we're we're powered by individual donations. We don't take any corporate uh, uh, cash, and that um, at uh, www dot zina z i n a for congress uh, dot com if folks want to you know maybe give me like i tell them you know give me give me buy me a cup of coffee every month five dollar recurring donation would be ideal <laughs> yeah. so that's my plug <laughs> yeah and the recurring yeah. donations are super important for those who don't know because it allows campaigns to really predict you know what revenue they're going to have and how many people to hire and you know it's just it's a lot more uh, financial stability that they really need when they're going up against political behemoths like Bill Pras Pasquale, who is raising lots and lots of money from special interests. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Including including fossil fuel. This guy took is sponsoring co-sponsoring the Green New Deal and he's taking money from the 
uh, Petroleum Marketers Association and the National Pro- Propane Gas Association. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he's perfectly <laughs> serious <service>. about it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, think and about this. Great. Like, just sending money to Xena, who would you rather have fight for you? Bill Pasqu- Pasquale, I don't know why I keep messing up his name, or someone like Xena who is going to speak truth to power in a way that is matter-of-factly, that's bold, and that really can't be denied. Like, she knows about this, like, the back of her hand. And few people in Congress know that. Like, we have a member of Congress literally bring a snowball to the floor oh my of the God. Senate. I- so imagine getting s- some people in there, at least a, a few, a small block, who know yeah. about climate change, who know you know what's at stake. That would make yeah. such a huge difference, even if we can't really get a majority, even in, you know, the Democratic Party. Just getting a larger block would be potentially game-changing. Yeah, I'll tell you, Mike, these progressive candidates, because they're not beholden to corporate benefactors, I mean, these people are amazing. They will tell it like it is, regardless of whether it is politically con- expedient or not. We are, are in it. We, I have no choice. I'm like, the people are like, whoa, how can you say that? I'm like, you know what? If I don't say it now, I will regret it in 50 years when my grandchildren, when my grandchildren, God willing, I have some, you know, ask me, Grandma, what did you do? When there was time, when there was still time to do something about it, what did you do? Did you sit idly by? Did you do something? And if I don't do this for my kids, for everyone's kids, frankly, I mean, I, I, I look at some of these children, I start crying. You know, I'm like thinking about their future. I get very emotional, even though I come across as a very sort of <laughs> intense yeah. person. But um, yeah, it's truth to power, and not only to me, but to all progressive con- candidates. Quite honestly, we should be supporting all progressive candidates, not just me. So. Absolutely. We'll, yeah. we'll leave that there. Zena, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for educating us about climate change and more importantly, fighting to take action. That means so much. So we really we appreciate win. it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Have a good night. You too. Well, that's all that I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far. As usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of the people who make this show possible, all of our Patreon PayPal and YouTube members. Um, You help us not just to survive, but thrive as well in a climate where YouTube definitely doesn't favor anti-establishment, independent political uh, content creators. So thank you all so much for making this possible. Um, That's all I've got. So I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, Black Friday. Please do not shop on Black Friday on Thanksgiving. Wait till the next day if you're going to capitalize on those deals because people should not be working on Thanksgiving. They should be spending that day with their family. So uh, don't don't buy in to corporations' attempt to, you know, take their workers away from their families. But um, either way, have a great week, guys. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoy the show. I'm Mike Figueredo. This is The Humanist Report. Take care. Girly Mike Fettuccini needs your support on Patreon. What a loser. Visit patreon.com slash humanist report to support the low ratings humanist report. Sad. My views are much higher.